347-326-9741. I'm Brian the Butcher Brown. Of course, uh, I'm always saddled with uh, these two anchors. Uh, Michael Delicious Dawn, what's going on, fella? Can you dig it? <laughs> Absolutely. And Nick Frank, what's up, Nichols? What's up, boys? You know my Jimmy runs so deep, I put that butt to sleep. <laughs> Damn right. Damn right you do. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> clown. Awesome. It's a, it obviously runs real deep when we're doing these uh, these fantasy uh, fan, uh, MMA shit because you've uh, pretty much raped us every season so far and all, already off to an amazing start, which, of course, we don't have to be bothered with for a few weeks because it's a slow MMA, MMA month. Yeah, yeah. I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the midst of digging out two fat, hairy backs right now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the impressive thing about Frank's is he impaled my tonsils, but he went in the B-side. So, Ooh. <laughs> Ouch! Yeah, yeah, I got a nice, I got a nice oh. upward curve. Doctor says I need a bacchiotomy. He broke my mama. <laughs> oh my lord! Oh, fuck. Yeah, so, uh, as far as the, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Went over them last week, but I got sixty something. You guys are both in the thirties. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking so, uh, terrible. That's Dola, pretty much Dola might be a, Dola wow. might be around four. 42 or so, but it's not uh, it's not very close right now. Oh, what man. I mean, what a joke, dude. It's like a broken record, dude. I, I can't even say anything to you anymore. It just sucks. The only good solitude I have is this shit's not going on for a couple weeks. Yeah. <laughs> we get to protect ourselves by not having to pick fights because, obviously, uh, we, we might claim that we're, uh, I don't know if we've ever said experts, but we certainly try to pretend like we're knowledgeable on this show, and it's uh, it's becoming quite apparent that one guy does his homework, while the other two guys do whatever they do when uh, these fights are on, because we're obviously not paying attention to all of them. Dub, you, I mean, I, I feel like I have a little bit of a, you know, a, a kind of excuse, so to speak. I mean, you sit there and watch every fight like Franco does, too, though, like a couple of geeks in the fucking nerdery. I don't know how you're always bringing up the back end. Franks doesn't miss well, a fight, dude. Franks is at every fight. I, I saw a fight at the wall over Modern Day the other day on the internet. And Franks was there. <laughs> Franks I the don't even up. miss. I don't even now at this point with this new Fox deal and everything else. I don't even miss the prelim now. Like uh, it's taken over my life. We'll be out somewhere. We were out on uh, on Friday night, and me and uh, my fiance and my mother were out to a nice Friday night dinner, and. <laughs> I uh, almost started a big argument because I was in a big rush because I needed to get home by 9 to make sure that Bellator <laughs> and the Ultimate Fighter were taping so I could watch both of them throughout the weekend. Um, <laughs> and ruined the dinner for everybody. Just ruined, the din- just ruined the entire night because um, we got dessert and I was rushing people and my mom wanted the coffee and then I got shitty with her so she didn't get a coffee. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Well, this was a nice relaxing dinner then and everybody could have a good time. Oh my yeah, well, God, dude. Fight night has gone from a two and a half hour, uh, you know, television program to a seven hour marathon of fights that I sit in front <laughs> of the television and uh, eat potato chips and watch. So it's, you, it's just starting to it's, it's getting too much for me. Nick, do you guys have a TV in the bedroom? Yes. Thank I mean, thank God, because I mean, you didn't talk about monopolizing that TV. Like anytime I go over there, like Justine will say <laughs> hi, and then she just goes in the bedroom, and like you know, the dog will go in with her every once in a while. Like she's just like, Mike, the dog hates you because she needs somebody to pay attention to her. And Zeus is looking at her like, when are you gonna hit the bedroom, lady? The boys are gonna watch the fight. <laughs> fight night. It used to be every couple Saturdays. No, no, now it's like it's like every third day. Nick's just like monopolizing the TV, he's ruining dinners. Like you, you might as well not even gone out. They, they should have gone out themselves. They would have enjoyed themselves. I could see Missy trying to get a coffee, and you're just berating her, and then Justine's mad at you about it. Oh, it's amazing, dude. Yeah, and it's just the fact that, and, and I really, I especially the big events, the pay per views with the good fights. I real, I look forward to them. Like come Tuesday, I'm ready for the fight, and I'm thinking about wow. the fight. I'm on the dirt sheets. I'm 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 thinking about my picks, and I'm ready to go. Um, oh man, Franco's well, scheduling, I mean, Franco's scheduling meetings at work. Like can't have any meetings from Wednesday on. He's got to mentally prepare if there's a fight that week. Like I mean, forget business. Forget forget being commission based. Yeah. I'm sitting at work today, legitimately angry with Dana White that there's no fights for like six weeks. I'm like, what? The, oh, wow. what are you, why are you, why are there no fights? What are you guys doing? Like, you know, you giving us a fight every week, and then you give us six weeks with no fights. Like, what the fuck's going on over there? I was, I was really thinking about, like, what are they thinking right now with no fights? Uh, well, you know, what you guys can do to keep your attention. Um, 
What's going on with your boy Peyton Manning? I mean, one, is he going to go to the Niners? And two, if not, more importantly, is he, is he going to go to uh, to Arizona, dude? Are you guys worried about that at all? Um, As I didn't hear fans? your question, Dolo. I don't know what happened. You, you cut out or something. I'm Frank, oh, I'm sorry. Allow me to to, uh, to reiterate. I was yes, saying your, your boy P. Manning, uh, I mean, are you guys thinking he's going to give your, your creepy Niners a look? And more importantly, oh, with God, Arizona dude. being one of the lead dogs, I mean, how worried are you if he goes to Zona? Uh, you know, if him and Fitzgerald get together, do they have enough? Frank, uh, do you want to handle this one? Uh, you know, I can go after you. I can go before you. I feel like we probably share the same viewpoint on this. So I want to hear what you got to say first, actually. I'm going to toss it to you. Well, first things first, I would love to have him because I think it would be oh. a perfect setup uh, – only be, simply because this. Alex Smith was he was good enough last year, and I'm not one of the Alex Smith haters like a lot of 49ers fans. I, I would, used to I be. Wouldn't be. I wouldn't be too upset. Listen, if they uh, there's talk out there that they have a three-year contract on the table with Alex Smith, if he takes that contract, I'm not upset. But if Peyton Manning comes in and signs a three-year contract, we got the kid we drafted last year from Nevada, um, Kafer Nick. So you bring Peyton Manning in, you get, we get probably two good years out of him. He's on the team for maybe three years. And he just grooms the kid Kaepernick afterwards because I think that uh, they have the talent to win either this year or next, and they have a young quarterback underneath them. So uh, I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world, no. But uh, and the second part of the question, I'm going to be really scared if he goes to Arizona because um, you know they talk about him possibly bringing Reggie Wayne. So it's talking about Peyton Manning, Reggie Wayne, and Larry Fitzgerald. Uh, the defense doesn't have to be you know world beaters for them to be ten and six. So I, I definitely don't want him going to Arizona. That, that that absolutely is a scary prospect if he goes over to Arizona. If if he can play, dude. You know, here's the thing. Like, you know, I, I was definitely an Alex Smith hater. I'm still kind of lukewarm to him. I know he had a pretty good season last year. You know, uh, people, of course, you know, insulting him by calling him a game manager, which I think is fair. But I think it's a, it's a good uh, step in the right direction with Alex Smith. I, I, I know they definitely are probably going to sign him. I don't think I'm interested in Peyton Manning. I've never been a humongous <laughs> fan of him. Okay, first of all, and I'm serious. Hey, Dubs, what, does, what doesn't do it for you? The four-time MVP? You know what? I don't give a shit about those numbers. He's lucky to have one Super Bowl, in my opinion. I don't think the guy, when, 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 the, when the, it really matters, he has really risen to the occasion and won for that team over there, okay? So I can't see him doing it for the 49ers either. Oh, Zeus, so, you're getting at you. You're Zeus in the background? Tell you shut Jesus, up. Jesus, Zeus. I'm trying to speak my piece. I disagree with Franco completely. I thought Franco was going to be on the same page as me about about wanting uh, 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 an injured, possibly one hit away from being crippled, Peyton Manning. And uh, I think we stick with Alex Smith. We give him. He actually wants five years. That's why he didn't sign that deal. And yeah. uh, you know what? He knows he's stuck. Well, he has sucked, and believe me, I've been very against Alex Smith. I was going into last year, I was sitting there going, yeah, great defense, but we're probably going to be fucked again because of Alex Smith. And then, of course, you know, he did what he did. And the thing is, is if they get him a nice, uh, a good receiver to go along with Crabtree, maybe he can do some better things. But as for wanting Peyton Manning on the team, I, I can't say I really want him, dude. I can't agree with you, Franco. Why would you want this dude? He, he's almost because, crippled. Uh, I don't really give a fuck about his well-being. I just want him to get his ass in there and play 15 games. <laughs> I'm not signing, the, and I'm not signing the check either. So I don't really give a shit. Where some source he goes in there to get this fucking head pulverized? And they put Kaepernick in. Oh, Alex Smith. Man. I, I like I said, I'm uh, sort of. A, I've, I've argued with other 49ers fans about Alex Smith, but the fact of the matter is, he's not a lot more than a, a game manager. He had a good year. He, all he had to do was really not turn the ball over and make some big plays, which he did. But you look at that NFC Championship game, and the Giants' defense was playing better at that point, but. I mean, I don't think he completed the pass to wide receiver until the fourth quarter. Um, he had basically the two big passes to Vernon Davis. And, I mean, if you're talking about fucking Alex Smith on the left and Peyton Manning on the right, I don't know how you're sitting there and, you know, saying that you'd rather have Alex Smith as a turf. Especially because Alex the guy's guy hater, Doug. That is fucked up. But Doug, uh, yeah, I'm an Alex Smith hater. But that doesn't make any sense, I don't know if the dude can really play. But he did one year. He had one year, one good year. You're an Alex Smith hater, like, and dude, I agree with your sentiment that, I mean, when you break it down, Peyton Manning's nine and ten in the playoffs in his career. Yeah. Like, I get it, hey. and I, that'll support your argument. Outside of that, I, I disagree. Only, and I don't believe me. I don't want him going to either team, but between the two, I want him in Zona because the Niners are clearly one piece away, 
and that piece is Peyton Manning, and if he brings Reggie Wayne with him, I mean, dude, Crabtree's okay. I've had him in fantasy. Crabtree is not a number one. I didn't even know if he was in that game, in the NFC title game. So you, Reggie Wayne comes yeah, in. One catch. He's, your, he's your number one. I mean, uh, I think for Manning it makes more sense to go to, to San Fran. They are literally one piece away. Are they talented and, and dangerous in Arizona if he brings Reggie Wayne with them? Yeah, but they don't, you know, I, I, nothing else scares me. Their D's mediocre. I mean, who do they have at running back? I mean, they're an okay team, but, I mean, talk about being ready and tailor-made. And if I were a team trying to get Manning, especially like a, a San Fran, uh, I would probably offer this guy, and before you go nuts, just hear me out. I know you're going to yell either way. I would I offer Peyton Manning a, a type of lifetime contract, and I know the, the name of it, like, you know, it sounds scary and stuff like that. Give him a lifetime deal. Like Frank said, you'll probably get two years out of him. You can have a mentor this other creep, and then basically when he starts to walk out, he can go right into, like, you know, basically an understudy in the offensive coordinator or a quarterback's coach. This dude is already an offensive coordinator on the field, and then you can have him basically, you know, moving up the ropes. You're telling me this guy can't be a GM in the future? Like, I would offer him that. Number one, I'm, I'm going to just uh, – a couple things. He, he's going to do that in, in, in Indianapolis if he does it anywhere. That? Yeah, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. And he's not going to be a fucking – he's not going to – once he's done, he's going straight to the front office like John Elway. He's not going to be on the on the field coaching quarterbacks. And you don't think he wants to be an offensive coordinator, though, Nick? No. I think he wants to be a GM or a, a president of football operations or a big wig job like that, which is he, what he's going to do. He's either going to do that or he's going to go into broadcasting because, sure. you know, he's good uh, on television on NBC or something like that. wouldn't you want that in organization? Like Isn't that a small price to pay to have him align with you, not only yes, not have no, him go he, to your rival and main comp in does, Arizona? There's, there's, if he does that, it's going to be in Indianapolis. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, wherever he goes now, he's just going to, it's just to finish his career out. I don't think yeah. they ended in, in bad terms in Indianapolis. I think he was there so long. I do think he likes it there. And I think if he decides to go into that aspect of it, I think it will definitely be with the Colts. And you can see uh, i got to agree with you the there, Franco. Yeah, you know, no, that's the, fair. Yeah, there's sentiment there. You can see from the press conference. Like, there's certain uh, yeah. deeper feelings, you know, between him and the Colts. Like, I, I get it. But if I'm the Niners, I would do everything I can to keep this dude out of Arizona. That's your division. That's your division to win. All of a sudden, he comes in with Wayne. I mean, forget it, dude. Who knows where, who else is going to go with him? They basically, the Colts, they basically cut the entire team. They, they, got of, they, they got rid of everybody. They got rid of, they're going to get rid of Freeney. They got, they got rid of uh, Dallas Clark. I mean, granted, these guys aren't in their prime, but I mean, Wayne still has time left, and he's already training with Wayne right now. I mean, Wayne's going to be a package to wherever he goes. I wouldn't want to see Arizona if I were you boys in twice a year and worry about them with an Alex Smith who basically had the you know year of his career last year, and you're asking him to do that again. I am, um, and I want to. Speaking about uh, releases, the uh, your your squad, the uh, defending Super Bowl champions, um, just cut a 260 pound pile of shit in Brandon Jacobs. <laughs> um, yeah, and there was actually some talk. Uh, what do you think? Do you, got, uh, you guys, you think he's going to get picked up somewhere? If he does, is he going to yeah. be a backup or is he going to retire? Or where, where does Brandon Jacobs go from here? Uh, I'm a giant fan. I'm going to tell Dubs to take a back seat right now. Oh. Um, first of all, if there's a Mr. Perfect song, I think now is, is the time to play it. But uh, Why? You know, I don't know if you have it in the archives. Uh, I, you know, of I have no doubt the Giants Usually are going to go. For me. Giants are going to go 19 and 0 next year. I have no doubt about it. Oh my god. Um, yeah. Uh, Um, did you say? I'm, I'm, I'm obviously completely kidding. But as far as B. Jacobs goes, he brings a good aspect to, to the running game. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, you, sometimes you, you'll deal with his crap with his mouth because he does run well. But he's not a lead back. Uh, I think he'll go somewhere and be a nice complimentary back. And, and at first I was like, oh, man, why, you know, why break up you know, the chemistry and get rid of Jacobs? They have other guys they need to sign. But at this point, the Giants have enough clout, and they've earned it over winning two Super Bowls in four years especially with this team this year, when I, everyone thought they had the worst offseason, including me, they got enough clout, dude. If they say Jacobs has got to go, in my book, okay, they've earned it. They've earned the right because they clearly have made good moves in the last, you know, basically six years. I pretty much say, you know what, if you think it doesn't work, we can go get another back to have a, be a complimentary back. You go get a back in the draft, you know. I mean, you can go get a young guy to run with Ahmad mm-hmm. Bradshaw and make a, a young running back can play the quickest as opposed to a quarterback or, you know, pretty much it's running back and corner um, who could really get in there right away just due to athleticism. But, you know, the G-men have earned, they, they've earned enough clout, dude. They've earned the right. If you want to get rid of Jacobs, get rid of them. Well, you know, this is all, you're saying this 
well before the season starts. But as we all know, as any Giant fan, as soon as they go on a two-game losing streak, they're going to go, these fucking assholes. Oh, we fucking <laughs> this team up. Kroft was going to be fired. Eli sucks. Dude, we'll go 0-1 in the preseason, and I'll be calling mutiny. Who the fuck are you kidding? You're clearly not a Giant fan. You clearly don't get right. the newsletter. All right. At least you admit it, though. You know, admitting it takes the sting off of it a little, because it always drives me nuts. Giants fans who are always uh, rooting their team, saying they're ready for the Super Bowl. Then after the four uh, game losing streak this year, you know, everybody needed to go. And 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 I was almost convinced this time because I I have always respected Coughlin and thought Giants fans were always crazy for calling his calling for his head. Yeah. I yeah. The funny thing that, about yeah. uh, funny thing about uh, Dolan's just being nice because he's outnumbered. But uh, the worst thing about Giants fans is, is how much they complain about Jets fans. And, like, I'm living in this area and sort of being neutral and not really hating either team and kind of rooting for both teams. Giants fans mm-hmm. are much worse. Why Giants fans are much think? worse. Jets fans are, are ten times as loyal. And, uh, you know, Giants fans are just – Poor bastards. Like, they're so fair weather. And right now, like, Dolan just said, oh, they could go – <laughs> they can't wait for some shit, but everything's great in the Big Apple now. They got a couple Super Bowls in the last few years, but uh, you know and they were ready to get rid of Eli. They were ready to get rid of Tom Coughlin. Uh, you know that's just that's just the way it works over there. And Tiki Barber is the best running back in the history of their team, and every Giants fan hates them. There's just there's no loyalty there. It's like they're like the Red Sox in the NFL. Uh, no, I mean I don't I don't hate Tiki Barber. I don't like how he basically uh, you know um, handled his exit more than entitled to leave when he wanted to. Wanted to be healthy. You know he had all those opportunities with the broadcasting. We've all seen how that worked out. I get it. It was more like the unnecessary shitting on the team throughout that entire year after that he right. retired, and it was pretty pretty apropos and exciting to basically see that they won the Super Bowl right after. Do I think it was because Tiki was gone? Absolutely not. Like, I mean, it's it's ridiculous to think such a thing. I think that guy certainly, uh, you know, shouldn't be shit on as, as you know, a, a giant and whatnot. And, Frank, to go against your point, giant fans aren't the worst. Yankee fans are, asshole. Oh, yeah, that's fucking true. tri-state area, dude. Yankee fans and sit there like they're at church during a playoff game. And, you know, you, then we go to Detroit, and we'll, we'll, we'll be playing Detroit. We'll be up 7 nothing, and Detroit fans are going ape shit. And the Yankee fans are sitting there like they're in church. And then in a home game, they're sitting there. The Yankee fans are morons. I'm a diehard Yankee fan. Pop fly behind the catcher, and they're going ape shit like it's 560 feet. <laughs> they're morons. Yeah, I I, I'm, 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 a a converted, uh, yeah. I'm a converted Yankee fan. Uh, I'm not a huge Yankee fan, but I, was, uh, I used to work for the White, White Sox and then just watched a lot of Yankee games. And the Yankee fans are the worst. Although they ever do. What's that, 27 World Championship? So many you got? Got rings. Got rings. Got rings. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all it's about ever. Dude, like, I mean, hey, dude, it's, it's, such a, it's such a ridiculous number. I mean, what the fuck? What else do you have to say? I mean, it's just a pretty ridiculous number. I'm uh, I'm I'm starting my vibrator up over here. Sorry, guys. That's what I thought. <laughs> I heard something going on in the background. That was uh, I didn't know what the fuck was yeah. going on. Frank was taking a nice Franco's party Franco's shit. Franco's fitting me the, the uh, My fiance got me the pleasure kitty. She got me the pleasure kitty for Valentine's Day. Oh so. yeah. Oh, you, you're never in the room to throw down, dude. You're watching UFC fights. You <laughs> shut that. So what do you want? <laughs> Fire that fucker up. I want to hear you come. Yes. Yeah, you know, it really is much more pleasurable with the oil. Are you sure you don't want some oil? <laughs> Are you sure I can't interest you in any oil? It is much more pleasurable. Ah, <laughs> uh, fuck. Well, I I know you're not talking about Leon Self. <laughs> I'm going to take that small little weeder. I'm going to take these scissors. Like, I know you're not talking about Leon Self. <laughs> and Lyle, um, I mean, you're clearly a homosexual, so. <laughs> That's going to be a little lady, ladies man for you, Dub. Uh, yeah, not, not seen very there. much. Minor Franco's past life. Watch a lot of ladies man, a lot of booty call, and a few other classics. Don't forget white boys. White boys is a major part of mine and Frank's <laughs> yeah. teenage years and early 20 years. Yeah, a booty call is uh, a hidden gem, a hidden classic. Maybe she got a brother up in Chinatown with nine inches of ding dong and knocking the bottom out that ass. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just get one condom? Can't break pack. Well, I ain't got six dicks to put them on. <laughs> uh, oh, shit. All right, let me write that down. MMA. We've been on for a half hour. Booty call. I'll have, to, I'll have to watch that. I've never seen booty call, so I'll have to <laughs> uh, check that one out. I'm sorry, boys. Well, we might as well broach um, the topic of MMA being it's 21 minutes in. Yeah. 
nah, fuck it. You know, before we go on, I do want to say I'm a huge fan of Roto Experts on Tiki Bar since Dolo trashed them, you know. Yeah. Jesus, Dolo. How did I trash them? I was sitting there uh, praising them when Franks was sitting there. We're going to be hearing that. What's that? We're going to be hearing. We're going to be hearing from the suits about this one. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, they might fucking suspend us a week without pay, and that would be fucking horrendous. <laughs> well, that's what's amazing. Franco, <laughs> Franco's a grand master leading clan meetings. It's fine. I talk about Tiki Barber all of a sudden. I'm going to get uh, the FCC's going to be in here. <laughs> grand yeah, master well, Frank's you know, over here, and he ain't a rapper, folks. We can't change. We, we can't judge uh, Franco for what he does on his uh, free time. You know, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, whether we agree with them or not. So, yeah. I guess we'll jump into some MMA here. Where do you want to start, boys? We'll start with the Ultimate Fighter, which debuted on uh, Friday. This dad. Where you want to go somewhere else here? Where do you want to go? Talk I'm open for shit. anything. I don't hear what you said because I was talking over you like a jerk off. What'd you say? Yeah, I said tough that shit. Tough that shit. Well, obviously, uh, Friday had the two hour. Uh, live broadcast, which turned into two and a half hours because they really didn't know what they were uh, getting into. Uh, I, I I definitely enjoyed it. I think it was a slight bit of a mess. Uh, you know, overall, before we get into some of the fights, and uh, obviously we made it into the house, what did you guys think of the overall broadcast? Do you think it handled it well, or, uh, you know, do you think it was mishmash since they really, you know, it was a new experience for everybody? What, what do you think, uh, Dolo? It's, I had mixed feelings about it. I, I thought it was. I thought it was entertaining. I like the live aspect of it. I think it's going to be more uh, pertinent and have more of a flow over the course of the season, as opposed to in this finale. Um, I, I don't know. It just. It really. It had no flow. That's. That was my biggest complaint with this episode. I, I was glad I DVR'd it because I was just fast forward through in the commercials and some of the downtime. I thought it was. It's certainly interesting. I mean, they're innovators in this in the business as well as you know this particular space. They're constantly thinking of new ways to kind of grow the business and, and be in the forefront. It's kind of hard to do when you have no competition. But um, it's it's. Uh, I thought it was good, but yeah, I don't know. At certain points, I felt like you know when they interviewed like Dana and uh, and Cruz in favor, and like you know basically they used to like one word, and then Dana's like, there you have it. You know what I mean? It was just like, and then it was just like crickets. Like you see Dana just like pan off, asshole. Go to something else. Like I think yeah. it'll come. I think it'll come in time. Uh, you know, Dana of course came out and and was saying it was amazing. You know, he thought it was great. Of course, how's he not going to say that? I, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I think I, that's what I liked about the uh, initial show in the past. That it was just it was just a marathon of fights. You were getting a fight, and then you were just banging into the next one. It was none of this, like, you know, these guys talking about all, all the stuff, you know, in their background, and then they just go out and get beat. Like, I don't give a shit. I don't need to know this guy then. Well, I don't need to get vested in it. Like, you know, overall, though, I was, I was pretty happy with it. And Frank's was right to ruin dinner because I DVR'd it, and I missed the last, you know, half an hour. So Frank's was yeah, 100% you gotta put right. The, uh, you got to put the – see, that's what's great about direct TV when you – when I DVR something that's live, it asks me, do you want to add a 30-minute extension because this program is live? So it does all the, it takes yeah, all the guesswork out of it for me. Your yeah, DVR is very smart. Very yeah, smart. My DVR, my DVR has in the, uh, the IQ of uh, air. Um, <laughs> Franco's going to be the reason this, uh, this whole world ends, dude. Franco's DVR is self-aware. It's how Terminator Jesus. 2 started. That always frightens me. I'm always scared of the machines rising up. You know, it does. Uh, it, 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 Terminator is like a true story to me. It's gonna fucking happen, boys. That's why you know, I'm like that. Says a Betamax and an Atari. He wants to, to keep his technology where it belongs in 1987. <laughs> I'm like the oh, uh, the DVR Nazi. You're only allowed like 100 hours of programming, and you're only able to tape 50 shows. So uh, my fiance and I are always arguing over the DVR because you can only tape two shows at a time. So whenever uh, I always go to like to manage the recording. And Raw. the thing that's annoying is when I go and I put, I, I'm like taping, let's say, uh, uh, whatever, some show that I've been taping forever, that like uh, Store Wars, the, the show on A and E that I love. So oh, I'm taping that, and then I want to tape something new like The Ultimate Fighter. If there's two things taping at the same time, it's going to tape the older thing first. So whatever's higher on the priority list, which would be like Store Wars, it tapes over the thing that I just set to record. So like I miss my shows that way. So. Once a week, I go in there and I uh, I move my programs up and down. So I don't know why I'm talking about this. This type of detail. I don't know either. But I was it. very interested. It was more interesting than uh, the, the the tough debut. But uh, you know, I, I agree with a lot of. Do- 
Dolo's points. Uh, I thought it had some good points, some bad points. Uh, Bill Brown won. Uh, said in the chat room, uh, they need commentary during the fights, which I know sometimes we complain about Joe Rogan and his, and his fucking over-exasperated uh, uh, delivery with some dudes and stuff. But you know what? Especially since we don't know these guys, uh, you know, and it was a live two-hour thing. You know, in the past when we had the, the rapid-fire fights or they only put the good ones out there when it was taped, you know, obviously you don't know what's going to happen when it's live. So there were some fights that were just dragging on. So, you know, if we would have heard some facts about these dudes or maybe some decent wins they had in their careers, you would have been a little bit more invested in it. Uh, but, you know, overall, I thought the presentation was good. I think it's going to go uh, better uh, as the season goes on. Also, like you said, Dolo, because obviously they're going to be editing this whole week that they're in the house, so that's going to make up the bulk of the show next week, and then we're just going to have one live fight. Hopefully now, with that, you know, Dominic Cruz and, and, and Uriah might be a little bit more vocal about things going on. Um, you know, well, actually, they're going to be in the corner, so I don't know. I guess Dana White will have to rely on for uh, some commentary during the fights. So, but I won't get it during the live fights at all. So I take that back. I'm an idiot for even bringing it up. But uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know, man. I like yeah. Dominic Cruz sitting there and saying, "Dirty, dirty." dirty. It's like a street dirty. fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the, here's my problem dirty with Dominic Cruz. Cruz. Go on, most, go on. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. The most entertaining part of that show about uh, to, to that uh, about that. I can't fucking speak tonight. The most entertaining thing about that show to me was like the little the muttering that you could hear them doing under their breath. Like at one point, I heard Dana saying, "Like this kid's got no stand up. Like he needs to take it to the ground. Like uh, there's no filter. Yeah. They can't edit it." So two guys are in there fighting, and Dana White's saying one of them has no stand up. Yeah, but I would rather them speak up. You know, they're trying to like mumble to each other and and share these little uh, side talks. You know, they're on like, like, a live it. fucking show. Let me hear what you got to say. You know, let's add some entertainment to it. Don't sit there and try to sneak it by. You can't. It's it's Mike. Yeah. They, they weren't yeah. delivering anything with passion. And you know, Uriah and, and Dominic were sitting there with like two kids on their best behavior, really. And that's the, the one thing I'm a little bit worried about going into into this season. I don't know if either of these guys are really gonna. Uh, be all that interesting. Dominic Cruz isn't very passionate when he's, uh, yeah, obviously he hates Uriah Faber, but, you know, he's always just like, yeah, you know, you know, Uriah's always there in the front row and I'm 16 in his yeah. face, but he doesn't say it like, fuck that dickhead, get him out of here, you know, let's, <laughs> let's get some fucking uh, 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 passion behind the comment, you know. Put that a vagina show. on his chin. Mm. Yeah. He does have a... You get the personality of a thumbtack. Yeah, weak vagina. And was Bill Davis there? It looked like Phil Davis was a coach. In, for some, yeah. I don't know if, if he's with uh, Cruz. He was, yeah. He's in the red shirt, but I saw him in the corner, Cruz so I don't camp. know if Davis is going to be a coach this season. I yeah. think uh, uh, he was definitely cornering uh, the guys uh, who, were, who were wearing red, which I think is Cruz's that's, color, that's Cruz. so he might be working with Cruz uh, for for, uh, for the season, which I think he might be in his camp, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't yeah, think he is. Like Franco, worst... Franco answer it. Uh, yeah, he does. Uh, oh, he does? Okay. Camp. And oh, um, well. as, as Bill Brown pointed out, really uh, the most disappointing thing about the night uh, for me was that Dakota Bag Ocox yes. Cochran didn't deliver. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. so we're not going to be seeing any uh, no gay porn stars on our on our Friday night fight. Very disappointed because I'm not going to you know let anybody know what I like to do in my spare time, but I have uh, definitely enjoyed watching uh, Bag Cox perform um, only in <laughs> MMA though. All right, boys, you know I mean. The guy's actually got a good record. He beat Jamie Barner back in September, and uh, I thought this would have been a real interesting thing on the show because obviously some dudes probably would have been real cool with it, but uh, a house full of alpha males, some dudes would have been fucking really upset with it. So I was pretty disappointed. What about you, Dola? I mean, I think the UFC lucked out with this uh, for a couple of reasons. It, one, that he lost? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because Dana White and came out last week and said, you know, this isn't an issue, and, you know, the... The whole issue with Shondell is that, you know, she didn't disclose that she had done, you know, porn or, na not porn, but naked pics. So this guy disclosed it, so it's not an issue. Spread Eagle Beagle out, naked pics. Delicious well, he, he, he came out smelling like roses in that, you know, instead of, you know, an, an S up D. Oh, my God. Because he's out there with, you know, everybody, oh, okay, he's okay with, with this. It, it, the fact that it's a live show and these guys would actually be able to know 
this, I mean, if this were seasons past, if this guy made it in the house, most of them probably wouldn't have found this out until after. So the fact that this is a live show with these dudes drinking and stuff, eventually somebody would have had a, just a ridiculous slur or he would have been browbeaten about it or, or basically somebody would have pushed him to the point of popping him in the house or vice versa. So I, I just think they skated on it. They got some good pub, um, some curly pubs where it looks like they're good with, with the gay community, but they don't have to deal with this on a weekly basis where these guys would just be murdering this guy and basically calling him out. I'm sure some of them would have been okay with it, but somebody would have gotten loaded and basically started couturing on him and, you know, calling him all the different slurs. It would have been horrible TV for the UFC. It would have been great for us and, and the fans, but for, you know, all those hands across America tree huggers that Franco's lighting crosses about every week, you know, <laughs> uh, they probably would have had a problem with it. Well, a couple yeah, of things. That, that, that's a good – I'm sorry, let me, I'll be quick. That's a yeah. really good point, but I think uh, the other side of that is that I think the majority of the guys would be sort of accepting of it and – I think that if you tell what, the, the, the casual person who doesn't mm -hmm. follow MMA that there was going to be a guy who did gay sex, uh, you know, gay sex on film on this television show <laughs> that all the fighters... Very probably gay fucking. You know, all the, uh, all the fighters... Like would, I don't do fighters, that. It, most people would think that every single fighter would have a problem with it. I think some fighters definitely would. But like Dana White has said, you actually have to fight this guy. So if you're going to sit there and you're going to call him all these derogatory names and you're going to sort of emasculate him to a certain level that he's below you, and then you go and you get your ass beat by him, you're going to look really stupid. So if you're going to have to wind up fighting this kid, you might want to watch your mouth because if he beats you, you're going to put, put a you know, in. It's going to make you put your foot in your mouth. So I thought that was actually kind of a good point by Dana. Yeah, and it might have fired him up, too. Like, you don't need to give this kid ammunition. If every week he's getting browbeaten, killed with, with all this stuff, and then you go fight him, that's all, that's all the motivation this kid needs. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously in his life, because uh, apparently the guy's been fairly open about it. And, uh, you know, according to him, uh, it was really just during college. He needed the money and shit, <laughs> and, uh, you know... Uh, he does have, like, I believe a fiancé and, and, and a couple sure. kids and everything. Doesn't mean that he's not still sucking lying on the side. You know, it, it could be happening. But, uh, you know, maybe it was just because he really was desperate and needed the money. Whatever. That's neither here nor there. But <laughs> the reason why I disagree with you, Dalo, is because he, 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 a lot of things you said is true. But, you know, these guys, uh, most of the seasons there's been some really bad blood between dudes. And they've been able to, you know, hold, hold, hold off because they're all there for a purpose. They want to get into the UFC. They want that big contract. Uh, it would have made for great TV. Uh, everybody would have been tuning in. You know, uh, uh, there would have been a whole new audience, uh, whether it, you know it's there or not. I don't know the numbers uh, with, with a lot of gay people tuning in, rooting for this kid. People like Franco hating this kid, wanting him to get killed in the octagon. <laughs> uh, you know, just people who really don't give a fuck looking at him because you know he's he, he's a decent fighter. If you look at his record, he's had some decent wins. He's eleven and two. Um, you know, overall, I, I think, you know, it was a shitty fight. The guy came in with the wrong uh, plan. It was a pretty boring fight. He was trying to fight a safe fight. He was trying to get it to the ground the whole time. Um, I feel he got uh, robbed of the decision, but it's a tough fight to score because nobody was landing any blows or anything like that. And you got one round in these, elim in these elimination rounds that they set up to, to prove yourself. That's why, you know, the rest of the show, for the most part, was pretty exciting. I mean, overall, there was eight stoppages, so half and half either went to, you know, half went to the cards half were, were stoppages, which the incentive there was an extra 5000 per guy. And the first four fights started out, uh, two knockouts and two subs. So, you know, it, it really got off to an exciting start. And then this guy, with all this bag that he has, and uh, tons of people, I'm sure, rooting against him because of it, um, comes out and then doesn't even really put on a great performance. So, you know, even though I wanted the guy in because I thought it was going to be great TV, I, I, I was really disappointed in how he came out and fought that fight. You know what? That's that's certainly a fair point, and I was looking forward to seeing him fight. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to judge the guy, um, but I you do. know. That being said, that's not going to stop me from judging the guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I I don't know. I I have you know I've had a, I've had a pretty fortunate life. Um, you know, I had a mommy who wiped my hiney and told me it was more special than everybody else's. You know, uh, we've all been through shit in our lives. I just couldn't imagine a place I'd get to, whether I had kids or not, where like I need money time to start taking dicks like well, I, I just i don't i don't get it maybe it's because you know nobody's offering i, I don't know need some sneakers. But, you know it's it's got to be tough but you know what forget that guess what boyos guess what? why you're gonna get peyton manning you guys just signed randy moss to a one-year deal no nice. wow. it just broke wow. on sports i don't want randy moss, moss on the one-year deal what you just say you don't want randy moss on? no <laughs> no oh i don't like randy you're moss like, you're like He's my grandfather 
This kid's in your crew. Boy. This is one of your Niner fans, bro. This guy apparently looked amazing in the, the Saints workout and in the Niners workout. This kid who loves Alex Smith hates Randy Moss and Peyton Manning. You want this kid on your team? He reminds me of my grandfather, and he's been dead for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, man. I, he's, more, he's, more, he's more hip and modern than you. No, of course we need Randy Moss. He ran a, they worked him out last week. The Saints worked him out. He ran a 4-3-40. Like, teams were shocked at how they this guy. Was, we got no fucking wide receivers, man. Like, we that's, need that's great. one when, year. When it started in five, and they throw the ball to him over the middle, and he fucking gets alligator arms that doesn't go for it because oh, oh, he's oh, 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 oh. for that shit. Um, you know, then you will be complaining later. The guy's a top five wide receiver of all time. He can suck my cock. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. Good point. Uh, who cares? Well, let's sign the contracts in blood. Let's go out and let's get a title this year. If we, if they're going for Randy Moss, they're obviously – how much money did they get in gold, did you see? I didn't see, dude. I, I got to look. Uh, I, I, you know what? I don't even want to give you an estimate. I'll tell you when it comes – comes down, maybe I can comb through and find it. Um, I mean, not that you guys bet the farm on them, but, you know, uh, to be honest, yeah. I don't even, I, for some reason I want to put out there like seven or eight mil, but ah. I could be completely making that up, honestly. So, you know what, I'm going to say 70 mil a year just to get Dubs upset. Um, Jesus I, I, Christ, I don't, I don't that know. much? Yeah, I, I don't know what they gave him, to be <laughs> honest. I'm trying to find it right now. <laughs> That's how I feel about that news. That's all I have to say. I'm sick oh. to my stomach now. I'm literally you, sick to my stomach now. That's amazing. Now. The fact that getting Randy Moss can make you sick to your stomach, uh, uh, I, uh, I can't totally imagine is. that. I don't yeah, want to see wanna... you guys at all. I really, yeah, I don't even know what to say to that. I really don't. I've never been a fan of Randy Moss at all. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm literally sitting here ill now. So can we... You know, I don't even want to talk about football again. Don't let anybody look at that contract. I want to talk about things like gay sex for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the uh, hour and a half or whatever it is we got left. Okay, that's got me less sick. To, to Danny Hardcore and uh, him shitting the bed and I getting into the house. Did you find out what that contract was worth? Because it's really killing me now. Yeah, no, I haven't found it yet. And even when I do, I'll just text it to Franco because I love just hearing you pine. I, I know that it's killing you. I, I, yeah, can't, I can't believe you don't want this guy. I'm just going to text message. Oh, no, Randy Moss, three exclamation points. He's going to ruin your team. <laughs> Who sent that? Who sent it to you? Who sent it to your you? Your brother? Carrie Ann Nutsacker. Uh, dude, that girl was on the wire, man. Mouth of the <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm sure. She's probably in press row right now getting quotes. She, she probably, yeah, she's probably yeah. out there taking pictures with him signing the contract. Unbelievable. She's probably from a nut. <laughs> from a hoax hug. <laughs> I don't even know how to uh, As far this. as uh, we, we were talking before about the Ultimate Fighter, uh, the viewership numbers, they, they gave the ratings. Um, they said, it was sort of a vague report that I read, but the report said that on Spike Television throughout the whatever 15 seasons or however many seasons ah. it was on Spike, it averaged right around 2 million viewers per episode. Like, an, you know, each episode averaged about 2 million. The last season for Spike the debut was 1.5 million. So the ratings had gone down over the years. So the last season was 1.5 million, and then this debut on FX got 1.3 million. So it was kind of a little bit disappointing, I think, because it was a little bit less, but it was the first time on this station. Add in the fact that it was two and a half hours as opposed to one hour. So, you know, you're getting 1.3 million people for two and a half hours as opposed to 1.5 million people for an hour. So it's actually... You know, uh, it's more, um, you know, sort of beneficial as far as advertisements, and you're actually holding those viewers for a longer amount of time. Uh, but I don't know. I thought, I'm not so sure. I thought that FX probably is more uh, widely distributed than Spike Television. Like, I figured when they moved all these shows from Spike to FX, I thought it would be a little bit, uh, like, a smoother transition. I still think there's a lot of people who watched it on Spike and aren't sure where to find it now. Because I thought these numbers were going to go up, and they seem to be going pretty much down across the board. Well, they, they were, you know, in fact, uh, not in fact, Spike is counter-programming. They had Kimbo on last Friday hosting uh, the, the Ultimate Fighter reruns. So how could you, yeah. you know, it, it's tough to be Kimbo Slice. You know, he's very relevant in the world of MMA. And Unless you're boxing. Roy Nelson. Oh, well, that's true. Well, I doubt they showed uh, Roy uh, laying on top of him, punching him in the head. I no, think, they uh, did. Did they? Yeah, they showed the whole season, dude. They showed that whole heavyweight season. 
with like okay. you know Mitrione and Schaub and all them. Like I caught that that was on last Friday. They were they were running that. Uh, I think they started maybe at like six o'clock or so. But I caught the first episode, and that was when Rashad and Rampage coached. Um, so. Um, yeah, no, they showed everything in the first, uh, you know, the, maybe the second episode or the second fight was, uh, was the Nelson, uh, the Nelson fight. Yeah, that, that definitely was early on. See, how'd Kimbo look? Is he looking, looking good? I know he's got a boxing match coming up, I think, uh, this weekend. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. I was flipping back and forth and I was just thinking, uh, you know, about that grizzly beard and, you know, different ways it could rub up and down on me. Yeah, <laughs> would feel nice. And that it? Niners, the, the money hasn't been disclosed yet. Yeah, he only oh, okay. said one-year deal, so I don't know where I got seven or eight, but let's stick with that because it seemed to get a pretty big rise out of you. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it, I wouldn't doubt it, you know. I mean, regardless of how I feel about Randy Moss, he does come with uh, a bunch of numbers, and uh, he's a very solid deep threat. I just, uh, I don't know, things ain't going his way, he gives up. I mean, if he, I don't, all right, I'm not going to get into it. Fuck it, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, Kevin Kevin Dolan, I guess he's a guest in the chat room, but he just sent me some text messages. It says R Moss to the Niners, gross. Wish there was an MM radio show to break this news on. And then he says, <laughs> breaking breaking news. T O just signed by Niners. Oh wait, and Roger Craig. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, by the way, Doug, did you ever uh, you look at the G Docs League? Uh, Dolo. Uh, no. The commission, Dahmer's not running uh, baseball this year, so we got no yeah. league. I heard, you man. You, you'd mention that to me, dude. Dahmer jumped ship. I don't know what that kid's deal is. Yeah, he said he got douched on a couple uh, entry fees, so he didn't feel like dealing with it anymore. <laughs> Who doesn't pay I an can't... entry fee? Like, uh, what are you, was, fucking uh, asshole? Like, everybody's it was, friends. It was, I think it was people that Monzo brought in. Yeah, I think people from his work or something like that, because I, I know I, myself, my track record, I never have to pay an entry fee because I always finish somewhere in the money. What about you, Frank? Uh, ba- well, I don't know if you want to talk so much shit baseball-wise. Football, um, besides that one year where I beat you in the title game where you forgot to start, um, uh, what's Ronald the Curry. name? I haven't heard this Ronald story 7,000 times. Ronald Curry. Oh. He beat me by one point. Ronald okay, Curry. Uh, let, let me put it this way. I was going for my second straight fantasy championship, and, of course, this loser shows up, somehow sneaks his way to the championship game and takes me out by one point because I started DJ Hackett instead of Ronald Curry. Uh, because for some reason my gut was telling me DJ Hackett because he had a nice game the week before, and I lost by one point. You know how many points DJ Hackett gave me, Dollar? <laughs> you know how many points? Buddy Wackett? Three. <laughs> Buddy Wackett? Ronald Curry was on my bench with 25 points. Wow. Opening up old wounds. It's not Sounds fair. Sounds like a Niners fan. Well, what happened it's in baseball fair. last year? Who, uh, who won in baseball? I don't remember. I remember. Who did win in baseball? I think did I got win? third place or something like that. I don't know. I'm always, uh, I I'm always in the top three in baseball. I, I always finish football. fourth, so I'm sure that's where I finished. I'm a, I mean, football, I've become just a complete and utter embarrassment. I haven't made the yeah. playoffs in it's got to be five years. Like, it's literally, uh, it's, I'm, I'm the worst team in the league. It's terrible. And you had a one-win season two years ago, didn't you? Oh, yeah, that, that was the debacle. But even you take that away, you know, the general feeling was like, oh, you just had a bad year. Like, no, I suck every year. Like, I look back at the record, like, I've sucked for five straight years. I'm like, uh, I mean, Captain Solo's been whooping my ass. <laughs> you know what matters at the end of the day, though, Nick? You beat Dubs in the championship. That's, That's true. I do matters. have a title. And I will be the first. So do I. Brutal to repeat. Nobody's repeated yesterday. We, uh, Not yet. yet. Nobody's won two titles in that league. I've been close. I've been close. I won the inaugural championship, got back to the second year. Well, yeah, pretty much been that, in the running ever since. When was that, 93 won that? <laughs> 2005. 2005, uh, 2005. Sir. That was only, I was only eight years ago. Unlike you, I've only missed the playoffs twice, okay? I, I had my uh, my string of uh, consecutive playoff berths uh, snapped uh, three years ago, but of course got back there again this year and somehow got raped by your brother, which was just fucking ridiculous. I'd just like I to let know. all of you creeps know I have never missed the playoffs in that league. You can check oh, that. You're, and, and look, I've never missed the playoffs. You had to I, have. Uh, no, I haven't. You're the I, king. I, you're the king of hey, last the least amount of points in the league, but easiest schedule. You're the king of last 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 in points and seven and six. You know, I'm going to break something down for you, Nick Frank. And first of all, I'm going to give you a pass because it's sour grapes, right? Um, <laughs> first of all, I've never missed a playoffs in that league. Second of all, I won the mm. championship, I believe, the third year. 
37th of all, my team every single year is fucking terrible. Like, from top to bottom, I hate my team. I'm literally that guy, like, like halfway through. I'm just like, I hate my team. I don't know how I win any game. I'm mediocre every single time. It just actually shows the deficiencies in your in your guys' abilities no, because everyone complains and cries. Oh, he just he doesn't score a lot of points. He gets in. It's about wins, my man. I get in, yeah. I win, and then I lose in the first round, and I'm out. <laughs> you're the king of uh, you're the king of 88-86. Don't don't only get another W. 88-86. Hey, dude, oh my god! It's, not, it's like swimming. It's like swimming with a shark in the water. I gotta be the fastest guy. He's gotta be faster than you. All right. I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> <laughs> you got a problem? Go talk to your priest, all right? My aunt had a uh, dick. She'd be my uncle. Who hasn't, uh... Yeah, whatever. We're getting off top of that. But who hasn't won? Uh, I know, obviously, Steve hasn't won. That's, Steve that's, hasn't that's won. He got, he got there. He just lost, I think, to Mike Castino last my year. My bald-headed brother's chip. never won, but, you know. Oh, yeah, well, he's the worst. That's he, true. I'll yeah. take that back. I make he fun of myself. He should be out of the league. league. He should get kicked he's out of the league. league. He's horrible. Kicked out of the league. There's, there was, like, a legitimate talk of that going on. Like, should we kick... Hey, Brian don't so bad we should kick him out of the league. <laughs> yeah, everybody at Neon's bachelor party, everybody like me and uh, Kev, no, Kev Don got there, and everybody's like, oh, man, like, yeah, no, your brother's not that good. I mean, I don't know. You think we should, like, kick him? I'm just like, we should kick him out of the league. And they were all kind of, like, dicks all around, and I'm like, that kid sucks. Like, let's get him out of the league. Sure. I don't know if he pays attention, but I said, we got to get rid of that kid. He's horrible. How's he still in if his own brothers ain't backing him up? I don't even understand. Uh, I don't know, man. Kid's got no hair. Can't trust him. Guy likes to see homo's nigga. Don't help me now. <laughs> Let's talk some real shit, though, dude. Rampage came out today and said <laughs> that he, the closet. No, well, yeah, he, yeah, he, was, he was standing there with your boy, uh, taking taking Bukaki to the face, mm. uh, whatever Karan, whatever his name is. But uh, no, he came out and Ball said soft. that uh, that the UFC has taken his love of fighting away, and he hopes that they cut him. And I guess Dana White has sent a text message to Rampage and said, after this fight, you're more than welcome to leave. So Rampage comes back and says, oh, Dana sent me this text message, which I saved. And they're like, ha, 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 he can let me go. It's like, dude, you're not under contract. He told you, well, he doesn't fucking own you. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I just don't understand. I'm kind of tired of Rampage. I don't understand what he's talking about. He's saying the UFC took his love of fighting ever since the Forrest Griffin fight. He's making it seem like he's climbed the ladder and he keeps getting up there and then like the UFC's just like ducking him and sending other people in front of him. Since the Forrest fight, the guy's gone four and three and he got a title shot and got beaten in the title shot and then lost to Bader, didn't make weight. I understand there's an injury, but I'm, I'm kind of over Rampage. I mean, he says he can go make money other, way, other places. He said he's turning down movie roles left and right. I mean, what do you guys think? Are you, are you guys over Rampage? Do you want to see him in the UFC? Where would he even go? Like, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Are you just tired of hearing him talk? Well, I'm a little uh, uh, tired of him complaining about how uh, he's not getting paid. The guy makes hundreds of thousands of dollars per fight. Um, you know, I think the, the one of the last things I saw was after, uh, I don't know if it was after the fourth fight or the fight after that, he made $325,000, plus he gets a piece of the pay-per-view still to this day because he has a big enough name to uh, sell pay-per-views. So I don't know, you know, he's comparing it to boxing, which, of course, you know, boxing is horseshit because it's the top dudes, even because there's 84 belts out there. You know, they get paid millions of dollars per fight, and then, of course, the real top dudes are hitting, you know, like $40 million, like uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr., but, you know, I mean, that, it's a different sport. I, I really don't know where boxing gets their money from. But, you know, the dude is well compensated. So for him to say that he ain't getting paid properly is, is out of control because they definitely have taken care of Rampage and definitely put up with a lot of his bullshit because he's attacked them a few different times now. And, uh, you know, I, I like the guy. I like the fact that he's outspoken. Uh, he's kind of a funny guy in interviews. But, you know, saying shit like that, like I'm supposed to feel bad for him when he goes out there and he looks sloppy as shit and, and, and gets beaten by Ryan Bader and cries about it. I'm sure he made, you know, two or three hundred grand that fight, and he lost. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think what's going on here is he usually gets his pay, and like you said, a piece of the pay-per-view, and then he gets pay, they get the bonuses backstage that Danny gives them. But he missed weight, so he probably got 20% of his purse taken. Yeah. So... That 200 grand probably goes down to, you know, 160 grand if that's the case. And Ooh. I'm sure Dana White probably didn't give him a bonus if he came in fat and gave that sort of a performance in the co-main event. So I think the fact that he didn't make a lot of money for this last fight, you know, these are all just assumptions that, you know, he got a piece of his purse taken and he probably didn't get his bonus because he came in sloppy. Um, you know, he just seems like a really selfish guy. He's only out for rampage. He never 
cared about building, you know, the brand or MMA. I don't think I, you know, I don't even think he's ever really faked that he gave, gave a shit about the sport of MMA. It was just about sort of marketing himself and, and, and building in enough of a character to go be in movies and uh, everything like that. But I, he just seems sort of like a selfish guy. And um, it's going to be interesting to see he's got one more fight on the contract. Dana said he's going to let him go after that. But um, it, I don't know. Are they going to try to feed him to somebody? You don't want to give him a guy that – you don't want Rampage knocking out one of your up-and-coming prospects and then leaving your organization as a bad business. So it's going to sort of be interesting to see who they match him up against because um, they don't want him to win and then leave. Yeah, no, I mean, I know Hendo was, uh, they asked Hendo if he'd fight him. Hendo don't want anything to do with him. Um, what do you call Shogun was quoted as saying he wants to fight uh, Rampage again before he retires. So, you know, that, that's an interesting fight. But like you just said, if somehow he pulls it off and knocks out Shogun and he leaves, you know, that, that sucks for the UFC. That sucks for Shogun. Um, of course, it, it helps Rampage go out on his quest for apparently, you know, mega money wherever he goes. It signs wherever that would be because I, I don't know a promotion that can pay him. Pro Elite obviously ain't paying well, or Tim Sylvia wouldn't be saying, I'll fight a fight for free just so the UFC will give me a uh, chance back in there. So uh, that, that's out of the question. M1 Global, you know, screws everybody who isn't named Fedor. Um, you know, I don't even know if they have any events coming up. Uh, I haven't really looked into them because there's been a lot of problems with them. And, uh, you know, I don't think Bellator, I know they're owned by, by a very wealthy businessman and, and stuff, but I don't think they still can release uh, astronomical figures to any of their, their fighters. I don't think they can pay them really well. So I don't know where he thinks he can go to make these fights. You know, I guess you could travel around the globe uh, and, and just be like a headhunter and ask for a huge pay just to show up and try to sell out arenas for people. And, and you know what? He has earned that spot with his name and everything if he can get that done, but... I, I just don't see where the satisfaction in that is. And as for him getting movie roles, I, I would love to know what movie roles he's turning down. I know he's yeah. fucking amazing in Midnight Meat Train, but, uh, you know, what else? I just don't, I mean, I, I don't care if this guy's out just for Rampage, and, and we've seen that, right? And that's fine. I don't really care, but, like, he just nothing's fact-based with him. Like, he's making it seem, like, to Dubs' point, like he's crying broke, like he's not making any money. He's making plenty of money. They've dealt with all of his shit. They allowed him to go do the A-team and do movies. They had him on the Ultimate Fighter as a coach twice. So, And one of them was after when apparently the UFC took his love of fighting against yeah. Forrest. So he was able to coach against Rashad. Like, I don't understand where he thinks, like you said, he's going to go get paid one. But, like, he's making it seem like, you know, this, this horrible existence. They put up with all his shit and let him do what he wants. And the boxing argument doesn't make sense because no. you're, it's not scalable. They're completely different entities. You, you can't even compare the two. Boxers make that kind of money because it's all independent. It's all individual, you know, promoters and things like that. The UFC is one organization. They don't make enough money to pay guys $40 million for a fight. And guess what? If they did, Rampage wouldn't be in that fucking conversation anyway. He wouldn't be a guy that they'd be giving $40 million to. It would be GSP, Jones, and Silva and guys like that. It wouldn't be Rampage. So it's like, dude, what's going to happen? Sylvia went out on a different way, right? Sylvia kind of went out on his shield and thought that he could go get paid somewhere else when his hype was still up and had lost a few fights. And I, he's trying I to get did. back. Rampage needs to be careful because I think he's going to be out there. He probably sees Gina Carano in a movie and thinks that he can do it too. And, and he was in the A-team, and he was made for that part. There's no other part he can play other than B.A. Baracus. I don't see Rampage being in fucking Goodwill Hunting too. So I, I just don't understand. He doesn't live in reality, which is the whole point here. So I, I just don't get it. Like, good. Go, go go fight Shogun. Hopefully Shogun beats him or have him fight whoever. And get this guy out of here because he's going to be sitting here showing up at shows like Tito used to be, trying to get back in the UFC and begging Dana to get in because he's got 37 kids to feed. I, I don't get it. I'm tired of this dude. And you know what? His actions haven't even backed it up in a while. So I'm just tired of this guy. You know, the Rashad season on for fighters when I started to really just be like, all right, dude, enough. Like, it doesn't even make sense. He just thinks, like, he's funny. And he's funny sometimes, but he's just, he, he's played out. Like, I'm over it. Yeah. I wanted the Rampage who came over from Pride and knocked Chuck out and fought Henderson. Because Rampage was charismatic, but he wasn't a fucking baby. We weren't hearing about all his problems and all the stuff we're crying about. The UFC stuck with him when he ran some lady off the road in Vegas. Like, in his yeah, truck. He literally had his picture and his child. name on it. Like, what do you want, dude? Like, your, your face and your, your name are on the truck. You're running people off the road, and they stick with you. Like, <laughs> what else could this company do? Like, they don't need the headache. You're not, a, you're not this guy you think you are. Yeah, no. I, and, and, you know, the one thing, everybody always wants to bring up boxers pay and shit like that. And, 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 you know, the other side of that is that nobody ever brings up, 
you know, uh, there's a lot of boxers out there that ain't making dick, dude. You know, they're 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 just sitting slinging punches and everything like that, hoping to get to that title shot so they can actually make some money. You know, the UFC, you know, I I think for entry level dudes pay pretty well, but for a guy like Rampage who hasn't done anything to prove himself to be worth the money uh, as of late. You know, he's getting paid a lot of fucking money. And you know what? If uh, he could have stayed at the level that you were talking about, Mike, there's no way that the UFC, if he would have held on to that strap and, 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 and had that great title run, he would probably would have been one of the guys being paid like a million dollars per fight, if not more. So Rampage has only himself to blame. And, and, you know, it's a shame because, you know, he is a charismatic dude. People tune in. They like to see, hear what he has to say. They like to see him fight. He's definitely uh, a, a tough guy who goes in there because even when he was fat and out of, out of shape against Bader, you know, it, it wasn't a great fight, but he had that slam, and that kind of added some, you know, drama into it because literally the way Bader came down, he could have killed him, and, you know, he, he would have won that fight on a, on a nice TKO, and Bader would have been fucking put in a body bag if his neck would have snapped. So, you know, do I like seeing the guy fight? Sure, but, you know, if he, he, he's going to act like this, I, I can't blame the UFC wanting to part ways after his next fight. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know. I, I don't even really like seeing him fight that much anymore. It, it's that guy that, like Dylan said, I, I remember the fighter they used to be, and I get excited every time he's going to fight, and I buy the pay view and I tune in to watch. And the last couple times, you know, really since that Vanderlei Silva fight in, in 2008, I mean, even the fights that he's, that he's won, it's, they've been boring fights. So you're looking at probably, I don't know, five or six fights in a row where he really just hasn't performed well. After that Vader fight where he really just looked out of shape and really looked like he didn't want to be in there, I mean, I'm, I, I'm in no way excited to see his next fight. Um, you know, I think he's sort of worn out his welcome, and, and, I, and I'm tired of his antics still. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes from here, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to see him in a, in a main event or a co-main event. I mean, I'm not going to buy a pay to see him fight. Yeah, if he's the main nah. car guy they're selling, I'm not. I'm not buying. And then he keeps, you know, he keeps throwing all these excuses out. And I have the perfect solution because he says boxers get make make all this money. And he cried about, you know, I don't want to be in the UFC where guys basically just lay on me and hunt me. It's just like, dude, yeah. Bader took you down, and maybe you can argue that he did that to an extent, but I still thought he didn't just do that the whole fight. But all the other fights, the other six fights you had. Jones stood with you somewhat, and then he choked you out. Machida stood with you with you the whole time. Jardine never went to the ground. Hamill never went to the ground. And you knocked Vanderlei out. Like, there's no bait to his it, argument. Bader Rashad stood was with the him. fight. Bader stood with him a little bit, too. I mean, Bader was yeah. out. He, you know, Bader was using his footwork and his angles, uh, and he, he mixed his wrestling in. But, you know, he mixed it up with him here and there, and Rampage, just was, he looked slow. And if you don't like it, then go box, dude. Because guess what? If you yeah, go box, you're going to get the shit kicked out of you. Like Boxing and MMA, like MMA boxing and boxing are completely different monsters. Outside of Nick Diaz and KJ Nunes and a few of these guys who actually have, you know, trained boxing and trained with elite-level boxers, like, it's not going to work out that way, dude. I guarantee you you're going to go in there, and it's not going to work out that well. And you're going to cry about it. You've been in MMA for 15 years. Like, it's part of the sport. Do other stuff. I don't know what you're complaining about. Like, this is the way the fight game is, and it's made you very wealthy. What would you be doing otherwise, dude, if you weren't doing this? I'm not going to cry for you when I'm, you know, humping myself up to a train every day after fucking New York City. Boo-hoo, dude. I, I don't want to hear it, all right? I'll go tune into somebody else who will just go in there and fight. I, I just don't, I don't get know. it. I don't know. I think he could be great at boxing. Kimbo's 3-0, and and he's probably yeah. going to be 4-0. Have fights him fight Kimbo. Well. That, that'll be a fight I'll see. There I'll, you I'll go. Play he's fighting cans, though. Yeah, oh, of course. Of course. Nick's saying he's fighting cans. They're just propping yeah, guys I up know. for Kimbo. I know. That was, that was my point. I was just saying. I mean, every guy he's fought, you know, they, they got to fucking eat uh, a bunch before the weigh-ins just to weigh in at about 210, 215, you know, and Kimbo's coming in like a freight train. So, you know, um, you know, I don't know. You know, it, it's a shame because it, Rampage, you know, definitely should show a little bit more loyalty because you have seen them pretty loyal to him. Wow. Nice toilet. Sweet. No, like, why'd you write a blog? blog? That's uh, the character. Like, uh, you like... You like to write write blogs, right? Uh, yeah, now and again. Now and again. And, uh, you know, maybe this would be a good uh, time to write one. You could write one all about Rampage's Jackson, Rampage Jackson's career and stuff and, you know, give your opinion on what Rampage should do next and, and, and you know, all these comments that he's made. Do you, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Where would I do well, that? Well, you know, there's a little place called the com, and we'll be back after this. Oh, well, 
A new era has dawned in blogging. Log on to the xlog.com and experience new standards and quality in commentary and analysis. Powered by rotoexperts.com, the xlog.com brings together the top expert bloggers with all the very best the internet has to offer. You don't have to search for the most compelling and entertaining posts and writers anymore. They will be at your one central hub for high quality. So join us as a new revolution begins in sports and entertainment only at the xlog.com. That's T H E X L O G dot com. Uh, we were just talking about Rampage. Uh, hey, hey, Frank, did you see that uh, Crow Cop fought over the weekend? Uh, back in a kickboxing uh, tournament? I'm just segueing into it because obviously he was a veteran of pride as well. I, I think Frank's is taking a chip. I think Frank's is taking a dumper. Wait a hold on. Uh, well, no, oh, did you see that Crow Cop, uh, you know, uh, you know. I didn't see the fight. I, I had heard that he was going to be doing a kickboxing expedition. Um, you know, I, I know he wanted to get out there, and I know he still wanted to fight. The UFC was, I wouldn't say done with him, but, uh, you know, they, they pretty much said, dude, let's amicably go our different ways. How did that fight work out? Well, Krokop won. He beat uh, Ray Sifo uh, by unanimous decision. Uh, I was actually going to watch, but I was running out of time before prep because uh, I missed Kenny Powers uh, over the weekend, and I found uh, it wasn't on demand for some reason, so I found it on HBO on one of the channels. So that's what I was doing instead of show prep. I had to catch my man KP. So I didn't get to actually watch the fight, but I guess, uh, you know, Krokop's still got a, a little bit of time left in that old body of his, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, kickboxing will add some, some years onto his career. So, um, you know, good for him. But, yeah, and that's where he yeah, got to start. So I mean, it makes sense that that's where he kind of made his name and and you know was was into the K1 world and things like that. And then he was just absolutely killing dudes with that uh, that amazing left foot of his. So he parlayed it into a great career. And you know what? I mean, these guys, it's you know you don't want to see a workout like Kenny Shamrock or Mark Coleman. And by uh, no means am I not. basically saying Crow Cop is like that. But you know, unfortunately, these guys find out when it's too late. Um, you know, that they should have stopped, and I just hope it doesn't happen with Crow Cop. But you know what? I mean, he's a grown-ass man. Um, he, he can do what he wants, man. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look for him on the Internet and you know, look for him to fight. I'm not going to pay to see him fight. But, I mean, he's a guy that no. I'll always watch fight. I mean, he's, he's another guy who he just always brings it. And, you know, talk about a professional. You never hear any complaints. Maybe it's because he doesn't speak English, but uh, I'm pretty happy with <laughs> He speaks some. I'm very happy to be here. I, yeah. I'm happy with my performance. Uh, you know, uh, if he dies, he dies. Yeah, exactly. If he dies, he dies. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll wrap it up. Well, not wrap it up, but uh, I also want to talk about another Pride veteran who uh, also had a fight over the weekend, and I think he had a pretty strong showing and didn't embarrass himself again. Hmm. Um, it was the debut of uh, the Super Fight League, which I, 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 I don't think I talked about it here, maybe on the Wednesday show, but. Um, I really can't remember where I brought it up. But obviously, this was the inaugural show. Um, they have, I was trying to find it for everybody, but you're going to have to look it up yourself. Uh, they have an amazing anthem to go with the show. And uh, it doesn't get annoying at all because every fighter that comes out, it's playing behind them. The whole opening of the show, 
played, uh, it was blaring over the loudspeakers. The two guys who are running the fucking show are sitting there talking, and they lower the volume a little, and it's playing. Um, at the end of the show, it played. Bob Sapp came out and played Bob Sapp. You know, it was just, it was the, look it up, Super Fight League Anthem. You won't be disappointed. That's how good it is. But uh, what I was trying to say is Bob Sapp, obviously, was the main eventer against another uh, fighter with great credentials, James the Colossus Thompson, which, you know, he has been fighting, but I know most American people, last fight they probably seen was probably the most uh, watched televised MMA fight ever was against Kimbo Slice when he had his ginormous baby head, uh, the thing that was attached to his ear, uh, popped in the third round, and he gave uh, Kim- Kimbo Slice a nice PKO uh, win. But uh, Bob Sapp tr- uh, trudged out there. He looked all the bit of the warrior that he is and uh, proceeded to tap out due to what looked to me like a possible leg cramp. Did you see this, Tolo? I didn't see the fight. I mean, I was I was unfortunately uh, somebody that, that missed the fight, but I got caught up and learned everything I needed to when I saw the <laughs> results of the fight. And it said, um, Thompson win via first-round TKO, and then in parentheses they always give you what it was, whether it was, you know, strikes, knees, and it said takedown. <laughs> yeah. So Thompson yeah. won via takedown. Bob Sapp clearly did not come to collect the check. My favorite part is, though, that earlier last week, Bob Sapp came out in an article and said he has been vigorously working on his ground game. He wasn't. He wasn't lying. Uh, the second he got taken down, he, it was over. So I, I can't call him a liar, but I would probably say he came to collect the check. I don't get why they didn't pay Crow Cop. At least Crow Cop would have come and fought Thompson. And and you would have got a real fight, you know. I would have. Why not pay Krokop? You know what you're getting. But uh, you know, I know that Sap's a big name over in that part of the world. But I mean, Krokop is too. But you know, I'm sure hindsight's twenty twenty for those guys. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't watch it. It doesn't sound like I missed much. I, I know Frank's watched it. What was your blow by blow, Nikki? Yeah, it was like you said. Sap comes out like a uh, you know big bad uh, sort of intimidating uh, guy, and you know whatever. I see him fight, I'm always thinking, oh, man, there's a big guy, he can do some big-time damage, especially in the last couple of years. And, uh, like, he really just doesn't want to fight. He, he, re- no. he literally is just there to collect the paycheck. Oh, they come out, um, yeah. you know, he got the takedown on him, and he literally curled up. He took a couple little shots. I mean, the dude he was fighting was kind of, like, a little bit surprised that he just curled up and basically got into a, a, a fetal position. And as soon as the guy started throwing any sort of strikes, and basically before he was throwing strikes, once he got to that dominant position, Sapp, Sapp started to uh, tap out. So it was just uh, if I had paid if I had paid money to to actually see that fight, and that was the main event, I'd be really uh, I'd be fucking livid, especially back in the right. Rankin days. That's right. So I know I know it was quick. <laughs> I, I know it was quick, but you are leaving out that here, here's my take on Bob Sapp. Before I tell you, Franco did forget to give Bob Sapp his just due in that fight. Uh, Bob Sapp is obviously, you know, he came out, I believe he started his career 4-0, uh, and then he had to fight Minotaur and Noguera, and that was the first time he was ever punched. Of course, Noguera ended up subbing him through an arm bar. But the first time that man was ever really punched on the button, there was just a whole look of like, holy fuck, this hurts over his face. And ever since then, you know, he just goes out there and, and either gets knocked out, the MO, like even what I do in uh, the new UFC game when I fight him in Pride, is I just take him down and pound him out. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but I think Bob Sapp at this point in his career, like, like we said, because he does all types of shit over in that, that, that part of the country, especially Japan. That's where he, I think he lives even. Uh, puts out workout videos, does this. He's a huge name. The guy literally is just signing contracts for a paycheck, and then he's going to lose. But you know what? I, I got respect for. Yes, this is my favorite how, part of the show. <laughs> the man does know how to lose really well. Oh, he I made it lost you, Dubs. Damn it. Oh, well, I will be, I'll, be, I'll be getting booed in another, like, six minutes, and then I'll have to awesome. re- uh, I get really back I'm excited. Off. But, Franco, you forgot. He did actually reverse Thompson and started landing blows. And then when Thompson reversed him and he tried to stop the reversal, he immediately fell backwards tapped and then started holding his leg but then was able to walk out under his own power after the <laughs> devastating leg injury <laughs> yeah. it reminds me of uh, a tactic uh, a guy by the name of Double J Jeff Jarrett used to use in the early 90s <laughs> oh, Double J Double J I don't really like Double J but you got a hand well, for the man he held it together when the blue blazer died so that's true that's J-E-F-F-J-A-R-R-E double T double T Jeff Jarrett Jeff Jarrett Right. Uh, did you watch that whole card? Super Fight League? 
No, I just saw I saw the fight um, on the internet. Uh, I, I didn't watch the whole card, but I did see. I don't know if that was announced. I think it was announced. Did you guys see that Anthony Johnson fight starting with that yeah. championship? Oh, yes, of course, believe me. I was going to bring this up because I know your dick got hard when you read that. Nick, I have a question, though. <laughs> how can he be the middleweight champ of the UFC in the fight league? I don't understand how that's going to work, which Nick Frank, for all those who weren't <laughs> listening and the first time listening, <laughs> Nick Frank came out um, a couple months ago when he was fighting, when Anthony Johnson was fighting Vitor Belfort and said, here it is. You heard it here first, folks. Anthony Rumble Johnson will be the middleweight champion of the world by the end of this year, 2012. He proceeded to be about 15 pounds overweight, get beat, lose half his purse, and then he got kicked out. But no, I'm glad he landed on the show. Don't! Street. Good. Don't! Yeah, and I actually I said it on the show, and then I wrote an article about it. Uh, but regardless, um, I mean, what do you think? Do you guys think he's. He, is he. Is he posturing to, to take a couple smaller fights and then get back to the UFC or over in Japan, or do you think he's going to try to make a career out of this? Do you think he's do you, do you think he's going to refocus and actually try to be a legitimate contender somewhere, or is he just now going there to collect the paycheck? Well, I think a little bit of both. Obviously, he, he you know he's out of work at the moment. Uh, he needs the paycheck. He's a big name. I'm sure Titan FC because they've been uh, they've been around for a little while. You know they don't have UFC money, but I'm sure they can pay pretty well for him and. Uh, you know, Dana White and, and I believe uh, Lorenzo Fertitta both said he would be welcome back if he can get some wins under his belt and prove that he can, you know, cut the weight properly and, and be a professional about things. So, yeah, I think it, it's a little from both columns here. I think he's uh, trying to get paid, and I'm sure with his name he, he'll rise up the ranks over there quickly. I don't I don't know what his first fight is. I don't think they've announced an opponent yet, but he's fighting on, uh, I think, May 25th already. So, you know, he'll, he'll be uh, fighting fairly shortly and if he takes it seriously, I think he will end up in the UFC because I think they kind of like the dude. They just think he's really unprofessional. Well, the thing that blew my mind was I was excited. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm an asshole, but I'm not as big of yes, an asshole as are. Nick Frank. You know, to True. say that he was going to be the middleweight champ. But, like, what Absolutely. blew me away is this guy consistently fought at 170. So the fact that he couldn't make weight at 185, I just, I just didn't get it. And I, I think he certainly, uh, you know, probably had no shit moment because, you know, th there are a few, a few places you can try to go make money, like, like we had mentioned, you know, the Titan Fight League he's in, and, and you know, this, this other fight league that Bob Sapp just basically bankrupt. But I, I just think these guys have this moment where it's like, okay, I'm in a career that is very secular. I have a limited set of skills. They're very specific, and I have a small amount of window to maximize that money. And the only some of the UFC pay, fighters yeah. don't get yeah. paid. So the fact that he's going to have to go somewhere else, I mean, he'll climb the ranks. Who's he going to fight? I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. He'll be some dudes, and the UFC will the UFC will take it from there. I mean, the UFC has a certain air about them and a certain feeling that some people might love it or hate it. You know, it's their bravado. I mean, Dana White came out and said the other day. Hector Lombard, who is an absolute monster, he's a beast, he's a champion over uh, at Bellator, this, this freaking guy is 31-2, and two. he's won, uh, as far as I can see, his last loss was in 2006, I think his number, at least on the internet, is a 25 in a row that he's won. Yeah. Dana White came out and said, ah, one day, you know, Hector Lombard will be in the UFC, it's just a foregone conclusion, and, you know, the CEO of Bellator came out guns blazing, saying they were in the contract negotiations with Lombard, and, you know, he doesn't understand how, you know, Dana White could say that, and it's just completely unprovoked, you know, basically why would he do it? It's the way the UFC is, and it's how they feel. They honestly believe everyone will eventually come to them, and, and they haven't really been wrong. The only one that hasn't, and it's a combination of it just not mar being married on either side, is Fedor. And, and the, it was because the UFC wouldn't bend over where everyone else was willing to bend over for him. So they had this air about them that they're going to be able to get him. They're going to get Eddie Alvarez, which is another stud who, you know, even though he just lost recently, was probably the big guy who wasn't in the UFC, right? The big guys who aren't in the UFC are Eddie Alvarez. They're Gil Melendez, who's in Strike Force, which is, you know, under the banner of Zufa. You got Hector Lombard, and you got Pat Coran. Those are the big guys that aren't on, that aren't under that you know that banner at this point. And Alvarez is going to go over. Anthony Johnson has been there and will probably go back. And if Lombard goes over, it's it's going to be insane. I mean, I, I, I you can't really blame the UFC. I mean, w what do you guys think? Do you think that you know it's inevitable? Is Lombard going to wind up over in in the UFC? And, and do you just hate Dana White's attitude about this whole thing? 
I don't think. Go on, Franco. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think he'll be very. He. Uh, I think it's because the fighters want to test themselves, so everybody knows where the best fighters are, and you know, uh, Bjorn Remney or whatever. He seems like a really smart guy. I saw an interview with him uh, earlier today, and, and he sort of. What I always said about Bellator is they need to be different than the UFC with their tournament format, and that's exactly what he was saying. He's like, listen, we have something that we think works for us. It's a completely different product than the UFC. I, I watch the UFC because they have a lot of good fighters, and I love to watch good fights, but I think he's smart with his business plan, and I think he's going to do whatever he can try to do to hold on to Lombard. But a guy like Lombard, you know, he's one of the better fighters in the world, and he wants to prove that by fighting other top fighters. I mean, they're bringing in... Trevor Prangley to fight him at 195. There's just a lack of real competition for him there. So he's going to want to go to the UFC, and that's why it's going to be so easy for Dana White to get him. Um, you know, so, so I, I, he, I think he will be in the UFC eventually. I just hope, I hope it's within the next you know, year to two years while he's still in his prime because uh, you know, he's an exciting fight for anybody at 185. Well, you know, obviously uh, Bjorn Rebney said that they're in contract negotiations, which means, you know, he's not officially signed back to Bellator. So, uh, obviously, the guy, he's a warrior. He's proven himself. Um, you know, uh, I forget exactly how old he is, but like Franco said, you know, he's going to want to get over there now while he's in his prime, while he's beasting dudes, because, you know, uh, the UFC uh, has proven to be able to poach the top talent in the world. Um, some of the guys just came over here to, you know, to sign along the way when they were growing the company. But now at this point, they, you know, they can really truly say we have the best fighters in the world. And when you have these standout talents just sitting there and, for you know, for lack of a better term, because I do like watching, you know, some of these other promotions and, 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 and stuff. But, you know, you can really kind of call them the B-League because, like Franco said, the, the talent pool just isn't there to really test these dudes and see how great they are. So they kind of get stuck. So, you know, Dana maybe threw that out there because um, he's confident that, uh, Bellator and, 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 and those guys aren't going to be able to sign Hector Lombard. Um, he's obviously given the guy praises before in the past, and now this is his way of throwing it out there, throwing a big monkey wrench into it, and, and saying, yeah, we want you to come over. Come on over here. We'll pay you what, what you deserve, and, and we'll put you up against some legit competition. And, and you know, you can fit, you know either finish your career here or whatever, you know, um, because every fighter wants to be here. It, it, it definitely is the best fighting uh, MMA promotion out there, and when you're running through people like that, uh, why wouldn't you want to go and test yourself against a guy like, say, Anderson Silva, who's the top of the weight class, top, you know, top pound for pound guy in the, in, in the world? So I definitely think they'll sign him, and who knows, maybe soon. Maybe uh, you know, obviously Dana knows more than us with what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So maybe sooner than later. And it's great for Dana, with, you know, whether whether it be you know the, the the social aspect of it, the social media and stuff like that. But all he needs to do in this day and age is what he just did. It seems like every single fighter who's not in the UFC, pretty much post Strike Force, because a lot of the you know, or I should say, Strike Force being the independent group that they were, you know, back in those days, like a year or two ago, those Strike Force guys, they had a chip on their shoulder, and and they had you know this complex where they were like pretty much fuck the UFC, and they were loyal to the Strike Force because they kind of carried that as a badge of honor that they weren't over there and they were in this other promotion. But you know, obviously things changed when when UFC bought Strike Force, but at this point. You've seen it. If Alvarez is going to go over, and you know who knows what happens with Lombard, these guys all seem that no matter how much they like being at Bellator and these other organizations, no matter how happy they may be, they all have one eye on the UFC. And all Dana sure. needs to do is what he did here. All he needed to do is know that Lombard is in the midst of contract negotiations, or it's about to come up, and he just has to throw out there. Oh, yeah, Hector Lombard's great. I've praised him in the past. I definitely think he'll be in the UFC at some point because if Hector Lombard didn't know that Dana White in the UFC wanted him, he's probably now, or at least his, his camp and his boys are like, oh, shit, let's go over here and get paid. We can go in your prime and fight Anderson Silva and these other guys. And even if you go over there and lose, you're going to be able to go get paid more than you're going to be able to come over here. And guess what? Bellator is not going anywhere. They'll take Lombard back. They wouldn't have a choice. So it was, it's a win-win for, for Lombard. And for the UFC, it's, they can basically just sit there with their B-sack hanging like my old man and just have people come mm. up suckling from the, the teat. Mm, very nice. Uh, no, uh, these guys definitely like it for, for a time, you know, because they, they've they prove themselves and they become faces of these organizations. They're, you know, they're definitely getting paid pretty good money not being in the big-time show. So And plus, 
they get all the accolades when these shows go wherever they're going. You know, they they they're trumped up. They get flown in to be in the seats and all that kind of stuff. And you know, it's a good feeling to be the guy. But after a while, being the guy in a smaller promotion isn't the same as being a guy in that big promotion. That you know, these dudes are getting shares of pay per views. They're getting yeah. you know, Rampage Jackson money. Who who says he doesn't get paid well enough? And and stuff, you know. Believe me, Hector Lombard would love to get Rampage Jackson money, even if he doesn't hold the title at, at all over there. But maybe he could leverage the fact that he is on a 25 fight win streak to get somewhere close to Rampage Jackson money, you know. So, yeah. um, being the face of an organization can only go so far, unless it's the big organization. And no matter how much they want to, you know, they may be loyal to that organization and really enjoy being there. Whether it's a combination of they feel like they're not getting compensated enough. Or if they're going to get major money, it's going to have, you know, it's a double-edged sword because it's going to detract from other money this organization can pay other guys. And then they're not going to have the elite-level competition. And one, these guys are elite-level, world-class athletes, so they have a drive and, and a hunger to fight the best guys. And even if, maybe if they don't, maybe a guy wants to coast and he doesn't give a shit. All Hector Lombard and guys like Alvarez are going to hear about is that they're not fighting anybody. And they're never going to get the full love and, and credit that they should and would probably just do, and it's no fault of their own. So if I'm Lombard, and I'm going to say this is a time where I'm actually Lombard. able to uh, – well, excuse me, I didn't know you were his fucking mother. Um, <laughs> but this is a time I can go get paid, and when else is it going to actually work out? Like, this is my opportunity. I better take it now because if I get locked into a three- to five-year deal, well, I don't know how long I'm going to be, you know, top of the food chain. You can get beat at any second, let alone winning 25 in a row. You've got to go get paid now, and you don't want to hear all that shit that you never fought the top guys. It's going to bring Alvarez over. Gil Melendez Absolutely. is dying to get over here. Oh, I know. Absolutely is. But real, real quick before we uh, – you, you brought up Gil Melendez there. I just want to ask Franco a, a quick question that we, we didn't ask. Now, you had a bold prediction about Anthony Johnson before. Can you boldly say now that at some point this year he'll be the, the Titan fighting championship, <laughs> uh, middleweight champion of the world? Dare I? He'll probably be, uh, he'll probably be fighting for the title in his debut. I don't, think there's a, <laughs> I don't think there's a whole line of contenders lining up for that uh, 185 <laughs> title over there. Bell's made a tin for you. Yeah. Well, well, I know Phil Baroni is the announcer for Super Fight League now, so you know he's not going to be in Anthony Johnson's way at middleweight. But um, <laughs> back, back to the point, uh, you brought up Eddie Alvarez and, and Gil Melendez, and obviously Eddie Alvarez is going to end up in the UFC. This is his last fight when he fights Shinya Aoki. Uh, was it next month? I think next month he fights him. But uh, did you see the shit? Uh, Gil Melendez uh, is scheduled to fight on May 19th, but they're clamoring for him to either fight BJ Penn or Anthony Pettis. So I guess... That, that fight against KJ Noons that, that Josh the Punk Thompson won, they they could give it a hot shit. I guess they I don't know why, I don't know what's going on. I haven't heard if the guy's injured or not, but they, they want they want a big name. They want Penn or, or Anthony Pettis. Did you guys hear that? No, I didn't hear that, but that's you know, it's smart. I think that Melendez he wants to fight the UFC guys and he wants to get that recognition. It seemed like he was really pressing for that and then it seemed like Somebody talked to him, like Dana or whoever, and said, listen, you have to be here for now for whatever reason, whether it be contracts with Showtime, whether it be contracts with Strikeforce, whatever it was, he sort of was told, I think, that you're going to be here for a while, and he sort of he seemed like he had accepted that. And uh, I think now he's just trying to be creative, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, whatever, I'll fight him under the Strikeforce banner, but have them come here. Uh, you know, I think, I think he wants to be in the UFC in the worst way. And uh, I think it's just contractual obligations that are keeping him out of there. So he's trying to find creative ways to fight, you know, top guys. Yeah, I think you're 100% right, Nick. The, the thing about that, I, I would love to see either of those fights. Not that I don't think Josh Thompson's a good fighter, but I, I would love to see, you know, the Penn fight. But BJ, I don't know what he's doing, but, I mean, BJ's, you know, not really in fighting shape when he's training for a fight. So I doubt that he'd be able to take a fight in almost, you know, two months' notice when he's hasn't fought since the Diaz fight. Um, you know, I don't know if that would happen. If the Pettis fight happened then I would be interested in seeing it. It would be the first time that we saw somebody come over under the UFC banner, fight a strike force guy in strike force or vice versa. Um, so I don't know if that would be the case. I mean, Pettis was the guy who was getting the look after the Luauzon fight to fight Ben Henderson before we found out that Frankie Edgar is rightfully getting his rematch. So 
I, I would I wouldn't mind seeing Pettis go over there and, and fight. I, I I think Pettis, you know, would probably do well. I think there's more to gain for Gill. I don't think it makes sense for the UFC because Gill staying where he is, that's already been established. And if, 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 if Pettis goes over there and fights Gill and beats him, now the UFC has lost their one guy that actually they can hang their hat on as, as king shit in his weight class over there and as being a top three guy in that weight class. If Pettis loses, the UFC basically has damaged goods in Pettis because then he, he went over there and, and lost to the best guy in strike force. Why, you know, who they don't bring over to the UFC. You know, I just don't think it makes sense at that point. So I would like to see it. I mean, everybody knows my stance. I think it's shared. I, I just I want to see Gill in the UFC. It, it, it sucks. It seems like this guy being as good as he is is working against them. The UFC has basically raped and pillaged every other weight division and taken every other fighter from there, minus Rockhold and Gil Melendez. And Gil's earned it. Rockhold's really good, but Rockhold hasn't been top of the line over there long enough. Gil's been the man there for like three to four years. I, I just I think it sucks, and everybody wants to see him fight over there. But you know what? It doesn't make sense for him to come over now. There's a log jam at 155 in the UFC. There has been for almost three years now with the, you know Frankie and BJ fighting twice, then Frankie and Gray, and now we're going to get a rematch of Ben Henderson. So now this Diaz-Miller fight is going to turn into not maybe not being a number one contender. I mean, 55 is so amazing, it's so stacked, but it's such a clusterfuck at the same time. It, it definitely is, but, you know, uh, Diaz and Miller were basically promised a, a title shot after uh, that fight, whoever wins that, and they signed it on the premise of, signed the contracts on the premise of that, and Dana White came out, I think it was last week, saying, yeah, the winner of that fight is definitely next in line. So I think no matter what, unless, you know, unless the fight is real shitty, um, you know, there's no way that they're going to turn around and throw Pettis over them, which, you know, sucks for Pettis because, he definitely uh, won an impressive fashion, and, and probably, you know, he's been sitting around a while now. Um, he should have fought for the title when he first came in. Um, you know, but this is a way to kind of satiate it. Um, I don't know if Pettis would agree to it just because if he does somehow beat Gill, then he's going to be stuck over in strike force. Anyway, if he loses to Gill, like you said, Mike, you know, he, he falls down the ladder either way you look at it. Uh, when he comes back to the UFC, now he's going to win, win one or two fights to be back in contention. Um, the the thing is, I don't know, Franco, if you've got the uh, the answer to this question, how many more fights does Gil have for uh, Strike Force? You know, I thought his contract was up after the fight in December, but I guess not because uh, Showtime well, will put their foot down. I, and I think he they, got they re-signed. Yeah, yeah, I think after that, he, he got signed re-signed. a new contract, like a three or four uh, a three or four con- fight contract extension with them. Yeah, and that's why. I, yeah, he read up, so that's why I was sort of surprised when that happened. They they either, uh, you know, they either gave him a lot of money or they, I, I don't know what they had to do to get him to re up. But like I said, it seemed like he wanted out, and then uh, like he renewed, so he's there for, I oh, think wow. it was three or three or four more fights. So he's there for a while. Oh shit! I, I see. I didn't know. I, I must have missed that when they resigned him because I I, I really thought. He, he was either up or, or done uh, with the deal, but I guess that's uh, that's the case. So he's trapped, you know. Yeah, and really what is he going to do, gonna man? Fight. You know, well, what is yeah. he really going to do? If he, if, he gets, if he didn't re-sign, where is he going to go? The place he wants to go won't sign him because in their eyes, they're, he's not playing the game that, that, you know, they want him to play. And this is where it's dangerous. This is where the UFC <laughs> owning everything is the problem. And granted, it's only in this few circumstances as far as a fighter directly just basically being – you know, punished for being such an elite level fighter, but you know, what was he going to do? He he had to re up. He again, he he didn't have a choice. He might as well go get paid. And you know, who knows what Dana promised him? But you know, Gil's not Gil's not an old man, but he's not a kid. I mean, I think he's like 29. So by the time this is done, if he's got a four fight deal, if he does two fights a year, he'll be 31. You know, and he's been king shit for a while, yeah. man. Who knows how sustainable this is? No, that's good. That's a good point. You know, I mean, I, I didn't realize that he that he signed for four fights. I, I didn't even realize he signed a new deal. So, it kind of sucks for everybody. But you know, I, I don't think many fighters. BJ Penn might do it, but like you said, Mike, what kind of shape is he in? You know, BJ Penn is definitely sitting there on the shelf, uh, not doing anything. And uh, you know, he, he could definitely go over there because you know, uh, even though I'm, I'm not the biggest fan uh, of BJ, you know, I respect what the guy's done. You know, he he proved himself over in the UFC. There's really nothing left to prove, so you know he could go over there and match up against Gill, 
and uh, put on a good fight. I, I still think Gil would beat him, but, you know, he, he might beat him, and nobody's going to sit there and really give Gil too much shit considering that, you know, he was one, uh, one of the pound-for-pound pound best fighters in the world at one point and definitely considered the best lightweight in the world for a long time. So I, I don't think many people are going to give Gil too much shit if he, if he loses to a guy like BJ Penn, but I, I doubt Penn could be ready for, the, for, for May 19th. Yeah. I don't know. I, again, we don't know what kind of shape he's in and, and whatnot. And, and it doesn't make sense for the UFC to bring Gil over right now because they have this log jam at 155. And they would bring a guy in who legitimately should get a title shot, if not immediately, uh, you know, get a tune-up fight. So, you know, we have all these problems about what are we going to do with 55. And, you know, I, I, I know Dubs and I are in agreement. I don't know about Nick. But I really felt that Frankie should have gotten the rematch, and I'm glad he did. But... You know, again, like I've reiterated, it's 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 got this log jam over there, and you know, I think Diaz and Miller is going to be a really good fight. I would say, you know what, if Pettis isn't going to get the shot right away of the winner of Benson Henderson and Frankie Edgar, then what I would have him do, maybe have him fight Gray Maynard. Gray's got to fight somebody. I mean, it would be a complete contrast in style, right? It's going to be either Gray takes him down and beats him up, or Pettis is able to keep it standing and and, and catches him, but. You know, the, the UFC is in a tight spot because Frankie was forced to have a rematch with BJ, and, and he won both. <laughs> Obviously, you're going to have him fight Gray Maynard again when it goes to a draw. It's a no-brainer. And uh, if this plays out, if, if the worst thing that can happen for the UFC is if Frankie wins. Because if Frankie wins and it's not decisive, and even if he just wins, you know, you're going to maybe give Henderson another shot right away, and there's even more of a log jam, they're hoping Frankie loses. Because then you can give the winner of Diaz and Miller the shot at Benson Henderson, or you can give Anthony Pettis the shot at Henderson, and you can say there's a great rematch from the last time they fought. And then you have a right away, you have Frankie go down and fight Jose for, for the title of 45, and, and Dana White is, is thrilled and, and ecstatic. The worst thing that can happen for the UFC is if Frankie comes out and either whoops Benson Henderson or, no, I think whoops him is okay because Frankie held the strap long enough. The worst thing that could happen is if he basically, Frankie edged out a close decision, and, and then at that point it's like, what, do we have another rematch? And then, you know, you're kind of screwing Benson Henderson. But if Henderson doesn't defend the belt, then I don't think you have to give him another rematch. I don't know. 55 is going to be so interesting. Yeah, as far as I, I think you're totally right. And the way that Frank Edgar fights, um, you know, I think that fight's probably going to be close one way or the other. He, he, I, I'm, I'm more of a Frank Edgar guy than a Ben Henderson guy. So I'm, I'm hoping that... Edgar is able to sort of get the decision, but I think if he does, it's going to be close. So, you know, if it's close enough, he might, you know, be fighting another trilogy. Uh, I don't uh, – the the general school of thought, a lot of people saying that um, Pettis is ready for a title shot, I don't know that he's necessarily earned it in his, in the, in his UFC stint. I know that Benson Henderson sort of had, uh, you know, uh, sort of hinted at that as well. He lost to um, – who did Pettis lose to in the UFC? Um, yeah, he lost to Guida. To Guida. And, and that's beat, it. That's his only loss. He, but then he beat Jeremy Stevens uh, and um, and then, uh, what's his name? Uh, Lohan. Oh, so, I mean, Jeremy Stevens, Ben Henderson, I heard him on uh, the MMA hour. He said, okay. He comes in, he fights Clay Guida, who's top ten, maybe top five lightweight. At that time, he loses to him, finds a tough fight. He goes in, he beats Jeremy Stevens. He asked Ariel Hawani, he said, where did you have Jeremy Stevens ranked when he beat him? And he goes, not even top 20. Okay, fine. And how about Joe Luazan? He comes in, he beats Joe Luazan. Where did you have Joe Luazan ranked? And Hawani was like, well, at, during the time of the fight, I had him like number 10. He said, okay. So he beats the number 20 guy in the world and the number 10 guy in the world. So now he's getting an automatic title shot. I'm not sure that he's necessarily earned it yet, which I agree with, other than the fact that Pettis had beaten, his only has got to beat Henderson. It was only a little bit over a year ago. But, you know, I'm not opposed to making Pettis take another fight, you know, against a legitimate top five guy. I'm not even opposed to having Pettis fight the winner of uh, Miller and Diaz, depending on how everything plays out. If the timing's right, then at that point, like Dolan said, there is a bit of a log jam. If you have Pettis fight the winner of Diaz and Miller, then you have a legitimate number one contender after that fight, and the log jam has sort of, you know, you know sort of lessened a little bit. Yeah. No, that's, that's fair. And I, I don't think anybody has a problem with Diaz or Jimmy Miller getting a shot if, from that fight. I think they should be in front of Pettis. 
Pettis looked great in the Lazon fight. I don't know if I'd put Lazon 10. I'd maybe put him like 7 at lightweight, but that's semantics. Like, I would have no problem with the winner of, you know, if Henderson just comes out and beats Frankie Edgar, I'd have no problem with Diaz or Jimmy Miller getting the shot. They've earned it. They've been beating elite-level guys longer and more consistently. More consistently. So I think that's fair. Well, when is uh, uh, Frankie and, and Benson's rematch? Uh, what, what, what part of the summer? What do you mean? No, they're not. Oh, uh, the bank, I'm sorry. I was thinking you were saying Pez. I don't think they've come out yet. Uh, I, I'd imagine it's going to be a June or July type thing. So you figure that's, that, you that's know. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, Miller and no, Diaz are fighting in May. So, you know. If, if stoppage, you could make that argument like you were just saying. You know, put Pettis against the winner of the Diaz Miller Miller fight, but of course, you know that's if everything goes perfectly. Yeah. You can't predict those things. And what happens if Henderson wins? You know, if Henderson beats Frankie, and and then right. you already have you know say you know Jimmy Miller as the the number one. Uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy Miller locked up with Pettis fighting. They probably you know and they and, and Diaz and Pet and Miller fight in May. He probably realistically can't fight till August at best, more like September. And then if Henderson right. wins, Henderson's sitting there till November or December just to get, you know, uh, to see who's going to may have that play out. So it, it's very tricky. It's going to be quite a tight rope to walk for the UFC, but it's a hell of a problem to have. Of course, I mean you, you have such marquee fighters, and you know it's a it's a great problem to have. You turn around, you have all this talent. Each one of these guys could fight for a title, possibly win a title on any given uh, 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 day. So, you know, it, it, like you just had a great problem to have. The thing is, is you have the other promotion that you're supposedly dedicated to with a guy who's supposed to be one of the best in the world, pot, ranked, uh, I think, number two lightweight, uh, well, probably number one now that, that Frankie lost. And, uh, you know, he's sitting there, and he doesn't have anybody to fight. I mean, Josh Thompson's a pretty good fighter and all, but, um, you know, they, they've split. They fought in, uh, twice now. One guy's got to win over the other, but I think Melinda definitely is going to going to beat Josh Thompson this time around if uh, he's signed the fight on May 19th. So, you know, it, it just kind of sucks, but it goes kind of what we've been complaining about with Strike Force the last few months. You know, as soon as the talent started getting taken, there's really not much to go over there. You know, there's there's not a lot of excitement when these cards come up. Um, I'm sure whoever they get to fight Gill, um, when we're talking about it. We're, we're probably going to be picking Gill. I mean, Thompson does make an interesting fight. There, he does have a chance there. But if it's anybody else, but Thompson or some decent, uh, uh, somebody decent from the from the UFC, like what they're calling for, um, I don't think we're going to be all that jazzed about that fight. Yeah, I mean, Thompson's the last one, really. They're 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 running out of of talent there. And uh, uh, with the me and you talked about it last week, Dubs at the. Dana White sort of having falling out with uh, with Showtime, uh, you know. I, I think the the Showtime, as we know it, I think uh, I think through this year. I'm sorry, Strikeforce, as we know it through this year, will probably look a lot different with uh, Zumba's involvement probably lessening or them trying to get off of Showtime because Dana White seems like he has a problem with Showtime now. And normally, when that happens, um, you know, he's not going to do business with them. But I wanted to bring up a different point. I was actually um, I read an article today about. Uh, Wyoming just became the uh, 45th state to regulate MMA, so now there's only about, there's only five states obviously left that haven't regulated it. Um, so I was I made a note about that for the show, and then I went back and I actually read the article, and I went into a little bit more depth. They're actually the first state they have an MMA only commission. So uh, you know in, the, oh, in wow. Nevada they have the state athletic commission that it's basically a boxing commission that regulates MMA as well. So what Wyoming did when they regulated it, they made a separate commission for MMA, um, you know, you know, specific to that sport, which I think is a great move, and I think you'll probably see, uh, you know, I think that's the precedent. I think you'll probably see more of those um, sort of popping up to where the the committees really only deal with mixed martial arts and not boxing. No, that's great. I didn't read the article. I wish I would have. Now I just uh, read the headline, and uh, that, that's a real smart move because. Uh, you know, it might alleviate some of the shit we're complaining about with some of these judges and, and, and the way that they're viewing these fights. It might force them into some education to be able to judge these fights if they're going to be uh, put put up uh, to judge uh, in Wyoming. So it, it's definitely a pretty interesting wrinkle. And, uh, you know, it, it's good to see them taking a step and trying to progress it along as, as opposed to just sitting there and saying, yeah, well, we've got boxing uh, we'll let the, these boxing dudes who, you know, I, I think time and time again have really proved, besides the fact that there's money to be made, they really don't give a shit overall of what's going on in, in mixed martial arts. 
And that's a, that's a drastic move for Wyoming to go from not being, uh, you know, a, a state that MMA is allowed into all of a sudden maybe being a trailblazer in that sense. Um, hopefully New York is going to be on the heels of Wyoming, and, and I think a small victory was kind of won today where one of the guys who's the lead opposition in New York, uh, Assemblyman Bob Riley, who has just been pretty much the poster boy in the face of the opposition uh-huh. legalizing MMA in New York, has announced that he's not going to run for re-election. So this could be huge. I, I think this is a good opportunity also, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, if, if Franks can work his magic, we can maybe get Randy Gordon back on the show. I know Randy was slated to, yeah, Randy was slated to um, get in front of, uh, you know, the Senate, uh, I'm sorry, the Assemblyman. Um, in the beginning of this calendar year, he's been a huge advocate. Um, you know, we had Randy on the show a couple months ago, and back in the day, Randy, um, you know, was, was actually a lead uh, advocate to not allow MMA into New York and was ahead of the Athletic Commission, and then it's since widely changed his tune and has become one of the leading candidates, uh, I'm sorry, one of the leading, um, you know, really promoters to get MMA in New York. So I'd love the, if we could have Randy on the show again. He, he seemed to uh, tolerate our, uh, our buffoonery. Um, I'd love to hear how his, what his feedback was from that, um, you know, that hearing that he spoke at, and, and hopefully Bob Riley leaving is the beginning of, of getting MMA in New York and, and having it in Madison Square Garden where, you know, just historical numbers have been done in boxing, and, and hopefully MMA can, can do the same. Get your boy, Franco. Get your boy back on the show. I got on the horn. Yeah, we could definitely I'll, – I'll, I'll definitely reach out to him. I don't think that would be a problem. The uh, – MMA art today, they had uh, Chris Lieben was on there. And it just, uh, I, I've always sort of been a Chris Lieben guy, but sort of like the same well, old story for me. He said the, uh, you know, the positive drug test was the best thing that ever happened to me. Now I'm, I have a renewed sense of, you know, uh, hard work and I'm straight in my life. Out. Like we've heard that, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to make fun of anybody for struggling with addiction or anything like that, but we've heard that with Chris Lieben before. We heard it after the season of the Ultimate Fighter. He had quit drinking because the drinking was a problem, and it, and then uh, then he was drinking again, Put and we already cleaned up. You know, this is like three or four different times that it's been the new Chris Lieb, and then he's focused on MMA. And it's just, you know, I've heard it a couple of different times now, so I'll sort of believe it when I see it. But um, Constantino um, Filippo, actually, I'm sorry, Constantinos Filippo sort of called him out. They asked him, uh, you know, he obviously had the great win against Court McGee, a few weeks ago, and they asked him who he'd want to fight next. And, uh, you know, he's very respectful, but he said he'd love to have a fight with a guy like Chris Lieben, who he knows is going to come there and stand, stand and bang with him. And, uh, you know, he has a lot of respect for him. He thinks that would be an exciting fight. Um, and I think that's an exciting fight, too, Filippo uh, versus Chris Lieben. I mean, I, those guys would stand right in front of each other and bang, I think. I, absolutely. I mean, Lieben's a warrior, and, and I do have to agree with you. I love Lieben. Um, he's, uh, you know, I kind of relate to his, his problems and stuff. Doesn't make him a bad person, but he he's been through it a bunch of times before. And you know, every time it's I'm the new Chris Lieben. I'm not drinking. He goes and you know, he gets into an accident. You know, you hear that he was drunk and shit. He loses his license. And you know, I, I really hope that you know this time it, it sticks. Just because I would rather see the guy fighting than than being suspended for a year. Um, you know, and and. You know, his talents are obviously are, are served in the octagon. The guy's a warrior. Um, I think it would be a great fight. Obviously, exciting. Both guys like to swing. Uh, I do. The one problem is that Philip Poo is a really good boxer, and Chris Lieben has had problems with dudes who can actually really work angles and have really good footwork. So, of course, the equalizer is the fact that Chris Lieben can crush your face with one right hand. So, you know, he loves to put the stamp on kids, and uh, I, I definitely would love to see that fight. I would love to see it too because Philippou looked amazing against Court McGee, and I mean Court McGee—he's definitely you know—he's he's a good 185er. He's, he's not obviously on the the, uh, the level of of a Chris Lieben, but what impressed me most about Philippou in that fight was you know, Court McGee is is a really respected wrestler and just a tough tough guy, and Philippou was able to sprawl and, and really just kind of shuck off all of Court McGee's takedown attempts. And as impressive as Philippou's hands were in that fight, his takedown defense and his ability to stay on his feet and, and, and really just kind of you know move around just a big 185-er in, uh, in Court McGee just really got me kind of fired up and really want to get behind Philippou. So I, I think a fight against Levin would be great. I think Levin's tough as nails. We've seen it. I don't know if fighting a guy like Philippou with this team, 
he's got going right now is a good move for Levin. Be a good way for Levin to maybe come in and if he gets a victory to uh, you know to, to kind of put himself right back in the, in the picture of you know a top five uh, you know top seven one eighty five er. But I, I think he'd need to be careful there because I think Philippou with those hands and, and that precision and his angles might get the best of Levin, especially a Levin that's got a little rust on him. Sure, yeah, exactly. First fight out of the gate, it, it's a monster of a job to try to uh, come up with something, but, you know, especially because of the fact of, of the boxing. Um, you know, anybody who can work good angles, I mean, that's why Stan uh, ended up catching Levin uh, in, in their fight because he was, you know, stay, stay moving when he needed to and uh, countering with a jab, and then, of course, you know, he, he caught Levin. And, uh, so it's a real scary fight for him, but... One that he that I think he can win um, because there was a couple times because Court McGee really isn't the best uh, uh, boxer and and he doesn't really have many KOs on his career but it looked like he definitely hurt Philippou a couple times when he caught him and you know like you said McGee's a big hulking dude at 185 so I'm sure he's got power maybe he just doesn't throw it uh, all the time or or he doesn't know how um, so of course leaving all it takes is that one shot if uh, Philippou makes the wrong move. And Levin catches him. I think Levin can put Philippou to sleep. But uh, it's an interesting fight. Uh, maybe a tough one right out of the gate. But you know, I, I hope Levin's definitely, uh, you know, he's definitely done what we're done with this shit. Because I'd rather see the dude fighting. Because there's, I don't think there's ever been a Chris Levin fight. That, well, all right, I guess his last fight against Munoz wasn't. Like <laughs> it, but other than that fight, I haven't seen a Chris Levin fight that I didn't enjoy. I caught an interesting one the uh, the other day. Actually, I was uh, Frank. You'll appreciate this especially too, uh, being a fellow lowly commuter like I am. But um, I was on the train ride home on Wednesday. Um, you know, caught the seven thirty train, and I'm I'm hanging out, and I'm kind of in my own world, half asleep, and. We are, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes into the ride, and I hear, you know, these two people kind of like, you know, it sounds like a little bit of a heated argument or conversation. So I turn around, and and they're probably about, I don't know, 10 rows back, and I see this grown-ass man in a business, basically a business outfit, button-down shirt, slacks, you know, this guy's clearly coming from work, and he turns around, and he's, he's saying something to some kid, I would gauge the kid, I can't tell, I mean, half the kids that are like 20 now look like they're waiting for their balls to drop, so I, I really can't tell, but um, <laughs> this kid was probably, I'd gauge it between 17 and 20, either way, he was about a buck 30 soaking wet, so <laughs> this guy, I guess he claimed this kid was kicking the back of his chair, like this fucking kid's three years old and is sitting there kicking the chair or something. Uh, maybe something happened. But So this guy basically stands up and says, how would you like it? Takes one step out. As he takes a step forward, just blasts this kid in the face oh, shit. with a left hand. Dude, it sounded like a baseball bat on a piece of wood. This guy wow. really, oh, dude, it was amazing. And this, this, this was clearly, on the train. This on the on train, the, dude. We were coming up to South Amboy. We were between and what, uh, what did the conductors do? Well, nobody was in the car, right? So, like, we're all like, holy shit. Like, did that guy just blast this kid? And, like, the kid was in, like, shock. So the dude, like, I just, like, all right, I don't need any of this dude in my life. So I'm just sitting there, and uh, I'm not. I'm paying them. I look forward, you know, like a good Catholic schoolboy. Um, so, so basically, the dude sits down and clearly thinks better of it. In about two seconds, grabs his shit and starts walking to the front of the train. And I'm like, where is this dude going? Like, we're yeah. not able to go anywhere. So the kid was in shock. Clearly, like I think he was just blown away by the entire thing. Um, basically, uh, you know, I guess his boy was with them, so they come walking up and, and going towards the front of the car, not looking for this dude. They wanted no part of this dude, and why would you? So basically, uh, they go looking for the conductor. I look as the kid's walking, definitely a broken orbital. orbital. He's got t- just two oh, streams shit. of blood coming down his eye as if, wow. you know, as if, as if he's like, cr- he wasn't well, crying. It was just a stream. So what happened was when... Uh, he was kicking a chair around the guy. He was the guy telling him to stop, and like, were, were they arguing? I guess, before he dude. I don't know, man. Like, again, I'm ten, row, I'm ten. I'm ten rows up. There was no like back and forth. Basically, this dude must have said something, like told him to stop or whatever. And this guy basically had enough. Turns around, blasts him. Bro, definitely like broken nose, orbital. So the conductors, you know, say, you know, don't open the doors as we pull into Port of South Amboy. So we sat there for 45 minutes while the fucking cops <laughs> had to come. So it went from being entertaining to us all being very upset with this whole thing. 
Um, but Franks, I don't know. You probably don't remember, dude. Uh, this guy clearly got arrested, right? So yeah. he's a grown ass man. Like, what what man is walking around just blasting people in the face? Yeah, but I've, and, I've, I've had that jerk off behind me kicking me on the train, and I've wanted to punch somebody in the face. So and I, that's I'm it. actually glad that the guy did. Now, that's the difference, though, dude. Like, I've, I've been the same way. I've wanted to blast people in the face. You don't do that. I mean, and plus you're a grown man. Like, yeah, who has time? Like, what kind of animal is literally, like, your solution <laughs> is to take a step and just blast this kid? And it couldn't have been worth it. The dude definitely yeah. had a stall charge. Oh, it definitely kid. wasn't worth it, but I'm sure dude, it felt he, really good for a second. He but better, I, he, I just want to know. Absolutely. Like, I want to know what, what he said to the kid, what the kid said back. Like, the context of it is very important, Nothing. you know? Nothing. The kid didn't say anything back because he didn't have a chance to. Oh, he didn't to. say anything back to him. No. Like, dude, it wasn't like sit down, like yelling and shit like that. Like, uh, obviously there was an interaction between the two at some point. And, you know, before that, like, I don't know if he's telling him to stop or what. But the guy basically stands up and says, how would you like it? He takes a step out. And I'm like, yeah, this guy isn't playing right now. I don't know what's going on. I'm coming in late. But this motherfucker's heated. <laughs> so he, he literally takes one step towards him. And as he, it was so calculated, this guy had made the decision. It was premeditated. Takes one step, and, bla and it was a left, and it was this dude had thrown a punch before. There was no two ways about it. So he got arrested. But it cracked me up because I realized, you probably don't remember, Nick, when we went to that Fedor fight last year, yeah. um, you know, and I told you the story when we were coming out of the, the parking garage. I had an issue with this guy last year, the one who blasted The same guy? Kid. Same thing. When no. I saw him walking, I was like, holy shit. So this is my story. Uh, we were coming home on a Friday last February. It was literally the day before we went to the fight because I remember just telling you how blown away I was by it. So I'm, yeah. I'm sitting there with my legs crossed, like my leg crossed, and I'm reading a book. It's a Friday. It's been a long week. So I guess, you know, once or twice through my leg being crossed, it, like, tapped the back of his seat. So clearly yeah. this guy has a history of it, too. So, like, the guy turns around, <laughs> and he's like, stop kicking my fucking chair. And I was just oh. like, I literally, I literally look behind me. Like, I'm confused. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and he's just like, he's like, how would you like it if I kicked your chair? You want me to kick you? And I, I'm just blown away. So I say yeah. to the guy, I say, first of all, we're on a train moving pretty fast. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry if my phone kicked you. I said, two, I'm in a suit, you're in a suit. Do you think I'm just sitting here kicking your chair like I'm four years old? And I said, third, I said, sit the fuck down before we both have a really shitty end to, end to our week. And the guy just basically sat down, and then he got off at Madawan. And now I'm really glad it didn't come to blows because this guy was, he was bringing more than I was ready to bring. I just basically you know, told him to sit the fuck down, and he sat down. I guess he had a better week that week than this week. Well, yeah, so that poor kid got a broken bone for your troubles. Yeah, poor kid got a broken orbital bone because he's been he's, he's been waiting to punch somebody for a year since your <laughs> interaction with him. <laughs> because he probably has been milling. Clearly, the guy's a psycho. He's probably been milling over his head that I told him to sit the fuck down, and he took it for some yep. reason. He's yeah. probably even next person to punch my next person to kick my chair is in a broken nose. <laughs> the whole time has said he's going. Oh, not this time. Not this mission, time. Mission not accomplished, this man. He added. That's hilarious. Destroyed I do. Kid. I do vaguely remember that story now, and that's hilarious. That. <laughs> Uh, that it's the same guy. That's so funny. Oh, yeah. No, it was insane. And the best part about it, the best part is I, the conductor, I don't know him beyond, like, saying what's up because I'm on the same train every night. So yeah. I'm, I'm standing waiting to get out as we're pulling up to Middletown, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, dude, what was that about? And he, he knew I was in the car, so I'm telling him whatever, you know, what I saw, and we're just kind of like, yeah, it was crazy. He tells me when the cops get there, the cops are basically harassing the conductors looking for their badges. Like, they were apparently concerned about them having their, you know, New Jersey Transit badges. But uh, the cop basically, the cops want nothing to do with the paperwork, and they're not even going to lie about it. They attempted, according to this conductor, to put the guy right back on the train. It's like, ah, put him back on. He's fine. Like, he's, he's learned his lesson. And the, the conductor is just <laughs> like, dude, we've been delayed for 25 minutes. Like, I, I clearly need a report to report to headquarters. Like, we can't just say we got lost for 20 minutes. And the cop's like, nah, he's fine. And then the conductor says to the kid's like, uh, I'd like to go to the hospital for what it's worth. Like, I'm kind of fucked up right now, and I'd like to press charges. And the cop, he said the cops were literally like, fine, and, like, just put the dude in handcuffs and took him off. It was unbelievable. Oh he God. said he was blown away. Like, the cops were blatantly like, nah, let's just put him on the train. And they're like, I don't think yeah, so. And they're fine. like, all right, we'll put him on the next one. <laughs> and they're like, excuse me, he just broke this kid's face. Plus, is this kid 17? If this kid's 17, he just assaulted a minor. 
You know what I mean? How old was the kid? He was older? I couldn't tell you, Nick, but, I mean, he looked like he was 16 or 17. Maybe he was 19. You know, I can't tell, like, with these kids. But, I mean, he was he was a frail kid. He was in a hooded sweatshirt and jeans and with a backpack. Like, he was not somebody commuting to work. This was the kid wow. who was just on the train, and he looked like he was, if he was a day over 18, my mind would be blown. Because he looked well, like just... a young kid. He, dude, I don't know, like, he literally had, like, little whiskers on his face. Like, the kid was not a man. And this guy was, like, a 48-year-old grown man. Just blasted this kid. <laughs> well, I bet he won't be kicking anybody's chair from now on. Lesson you know, learned, man. Lesson. You kidding me, dude? I got there slippers on just in case my foot taps somebody. Exactly, dude. So don't fuck with that dude, and don't be kicking people's chairs. I feel bad for his wife. Like, yeah, holy shit. Beating her. Oh, my God. So yeah, she's probably, she's probably has it coming. She's a pretty nice wind anyway. Yeah, she probably mouthed off or something. Didn't come exactly. Back you know, if she ain't got dinner on the table and she's got words to say, what else are you going to do? Yeah. LeVar, uh, LeVar Johnson talking about Pat Barry. He said he thinks he's gun-shy after that knockout loss to uh, Czech Congo. I said he looked tentative in his last fight. And, uh, you know, he said that he's going to uh, knock his ass out on Fox. Well... You know, um, I don't know. I thought Pat Barry looked pretty good. He had good submission defense. He did look a little gun shy, but LeVar Johnson's definitely got the hands to put him on his back. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I think it'll be an interesting fight. I think it'll be pretty exciting because LeVar Johnson's definitely going to bring the heat. Yeah, no, they're both going to give us what we want. That's for sure. I, I don't think there will be a shortage in, in that fight. And yeah, LeVar Johnson, you just look at that guy, and you know that that guy's heavy-handed, um, you know, and is definitely, uh, you know, not somebody you want to get hit by the uh, get hit in the yeah. face by, similar to this guy on the train. I'd like to see this guy on the train versus here. LeVar Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it'll be close. But uh, we got a couple minutes, boys. Anything else before I uh, go through the spiel? No, I think we're all good. Yeah, let's take her home, right. man. I think we're going to take this home just because, uh, you know, this kind of lies to me anyway. Don't cut me off at any minute. Um, <laughs> everybody, remember to check out Roto Experts. Check out thexlog.com. Maybe Frank will put an article up and make it worth your while. Check out Nick Frank at nfrankrotox at Twitter. Check myself out at uh, probably Flower, the number four ear at Twitter. Um, Check out my Wednesday show. That's uh, the Butch Block Wednesdays, I believe, at 9.30 sometimes. Um, and Dolo, how do we get in touch with you? Uh, I'll be the guy on New Jersey Transit, just headgear on and some gloves, just hoping not to get destroyed. Just a little sheep trying hey, to get dude, over that work. guy gets a two standoff when you go for the legs. So he had all the leverage, get, too, get man. A double. He, he was standing, the kid was sitting. It was a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> well, protect yourself. Be safe. I don't want you to get fucked up out there, all right? I Everybody appreciate that. for the years. And we're tapping out. Later. Stop.